Amen. Uh, uh, in Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 11 was a very important uh, portion of scripture telling us God's, the kind of relationship God expects between us and natural Israel and God's understanding of Israel. Uh, Israel is both uh, physical, natural Israel, as well as the church fulfilling uh, the types and shadows of things God spoke about Israel in the New Old Testament. In fact, you find all the things about the new birth in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, you find that they're all talking about Israel. He said, my people, I will give them a new heart. I will take away the heart of stone. Yet he was talking about the church, even though he mentioned Israel. So you have to understand that, that a lot of things that are spoken about Israel have a double application. There, there is an application to natural Israel, and there is an application to the church, which we can call spiritual Israel, because we are uh, spiritual Israel because of Galatians chapter 5. It says, if ye be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed. And heirs according to the promise. So we are the spiritual, we're not the physical, but we are the spiritual seed of Abraham through the church. Or rather, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a very important point for us to understand. So the, 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 the natural nation of Israel are brethren, spiritually speaking, via Jesus. And that's why the Bible enjoins us to show mercy to them. And the Bible tells us that for a short time, they were in blindness, you know, because of their unbelief. And you, God used that time to bring the Gentiles in. He said, now you've come in and, and, and they're in blindness now. So you're going to show them mercy. And when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, he says, it will uh, open the eyes of Israel. He says, they're, they're blind in part. You know, he says, I will not have you ignorant of this mystery. That the blindness in part, not holy. That's why the Bible put in part, you know, it's happened to Israel until. In other words, well, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, then the in part will be removed. In other words, they will now see fully. And you need to understand that, especially when you're dealing with Jews. You know, that there's a certain amount of uh, blindness in their hearts, you know, which will not be removed until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And... Uh, the Holy Spirit is reminding me of this fact. You see, as at today, which is, uh, we call it Palm Sunday. I'll be talking about the spiritual significance, uh, prophetic uh, fulfillment of Palm Sunday in my main message. You know, but as at today, um, the fullness of the Gentile hasn't yet come in. It hasn't yet come in. And you know, when people talk about the fullness of the Gentiles, they think usually numerically in other words when all the gentiles when we've preached the gospel to all the nations of the world all the tribes and all the all everybody has come in then that's the fullness of the gentiles and then we're going to be raptured and go that is not uh, incorrect but again it's not complete the fullness of the gentiles is two things the fullness of the gentile church growing into the fullness of christ it is that that will now trigger the second thing which we mentioned that will now bring in disciples from all the ethnos. Why will this cause Israel's eyes to open? They will be provoked to jealousy. Do you know that at the moment, even Christians are jealous of the Jews? When I say that, I, I say that in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a harmless kind of way. What I mean is this. Oh, look at the Jews, you know. You still see God blessing the Jews, blessing them financially, blessing them intellectually, you know, blessing them, you know, by His sovereign power in their lives, in the, mili in the military, you know, preserving Israel, you know, from, from uh, uh, Gentile attack of Gentile armies and all of that. You know, and even up till today, we still see that in operation in natural Israel, in spite of the fact that they're not obedient and most of them don't know God. And we explain the reason for that. The Bible says they are beloved not for their sakes, but for their father's sakes. Now, 
So what would make a natural Israeli who is not who is not aware of spiritual things jealous of you if God is still blessing him intellectually, God is blessing him financially, and he seems to be uh, or they seem to be better off than the Gentile church, you know. So it means God has to do something inside the Gentile church. So, but when the Gentile church and that is still ahead of us, grows into the fullness of Christ. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, which the Bible also talks about, you know, uh, that we might grow up into Him in all things. Everybody say all things. Not some things. All things. Then the Gentile church that has grown to the fullness of Christ will be financially better off than natural Israel. The Gentile church that has grown the fullness of Christ will be intellectually better off than natural Israel demonstrating the ability of the mind of Christ. Then natural Israel will now be jealous and they will now want to find out what, what you are doing and that will now open their eyes. So the fullness of, of, of the Gentiles that is spoken of is not only the fullness of the numerical harvest of people getting born again and coming to the church. It includes that. But it is actually much more, uh, it's much more than that. It is the coming into the fullness of Christ, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ of the Gentile church that will now manifest the glory of God, manifest the, the, the power of God, manifest the wisdom of God, manifest, you know, uh, uh, the blessings, the financial blessings of God. The church, I've prophesied this over the years, and it's not just Olubi Johnson prophesied, I'm just telling you what the, what the Bible tells us, you know, will become the most powerful uh, financial institution on the earth. The Bible says so. It says that you will lend to many nations, you will not borrow. You will be above only and not beneath. That has not happened. It's never happened to Israel. The best they had was under the reign of Solomon and David, you know, down through the years, you know, but that is going to happen with the church. And when that happens, it will provoke natural Israel to jealousy. Now, who are these people? Who are these people? You know, and they too will now want to come to know uh, the Messiah, that will now open, that blindness that, well, that was in part that's happened to them will now be removed so that they can now see clearly. Praise the Lord. And so we, we need to have uh, that understanding. And so today we're just going to look at the first two verses of Romans chapter 12. And here, as they are actually loaded, these two verses are very loaded. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, By the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Some of the other translations says, which is your spiritual worship. You know, others uh, uh, say, you know, with, this is your true and proper worship. The New International Version says, the Amplified Bible says, um, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. In other words, if you're going to worship God properly, you need to present your body as a living sacrifice. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. I like that word prove. You know, I will explain it further during my exposition. You know, what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? And uh, what I want us to understand is that he said, I beseech you therefore. Anytime you say therefore in the Bible, find out what is therefore. Look at what he said in the preceding from chapter 11. Chapter 11, which is exactly what I've been saying, you know, has been talking about the Gentiles and the Jews. The, the natural Jews and then the Gentiles that have become born again and the kind of relationship between them and the fact that God has concluded all of them, both Gentile and Jew, in unbelief. When the Gentiles didn't know God, the Jews knew God, you know, through the oracles that were given to them by Moses and the, and the, and the, and the uh, uh, covenant that he made with them and David and uh, Abraham, David and all the patriarchs and all of that. Now things have switched, you know, the Jews nine some kind of partial blindness the gentiles now have come to know god through jesus christ and so the bible says that all oh, the depth of the wisdom and the knowledge of god it's god's wisdom that has uh, enabled him to deal with equity 
both Jew and Gentile. See, when you study the Bible very well, you find that God is not partial. He's no respecter of persons. Sure, he showed favor to the Gentiles under the Old Testament, but the Gent- the, sorry, the Jews, excuse me, but the Jews were just a, uh, an avenue, they were just a tool in God's hand to bring salvation to the Gentiles. Now that he has brought salvation to the Gentiles, God is now saying, just like I used the Jews to bring salvation to you, I'm now going to use you to bring salvation to the Jews. Give him a clap offering. That is why he now said, I beseech you therefore. In other words, because you have this assignment to bring the Jews to the, comp- you know, so that they will no longer be blind in part, you need to present your body a living sacrifice so that the Christ in you can be manifest outside. If you don't present your body a living sacrifice, you will not be able to enter that fullness of Christ that will now open the eyes of the Jewish church, of, of the Jewish nation. This, that, that's the reason why the therefore is there. And so we go back to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Now he tells us that it, this this assignment of presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to to God, which is our spiritual worship of God, has to be done by the mercies of God. You know, this scripture was opened up to me in the last few years. When I was in the last few years, I'm talking about, you know, 2018, 2017, you know, I've been reading it all these years. You know, it just jumped out to me that that mercy is in plural. It's not one mercy. And that's why God has given us this understanding of, you know, asking for mercy several times during the day. You know, and when you receive the mercy of God, it gives you three things. It ministers three things to you. One, the blood of Jesus. He says, I'll be merciful unto their righteousness. The, you know, the, and in First John, he says that, you know, um, I will, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. A present continuous activity. It's not just something that happens when we get born again. To the cleansing of sin is supposed to be used by us, you know, by the blood of Jesus. Use, use, we are supposed to use the blood of Jesus for cleansing of sin on a consistent basis by asking for mercy. You know, and I explained this the other day when I taught on, you know, cleansing sin and guilt. and uh, cl- uh, Cleansing sin and a guilty conscience. You know, the sins that we commit unconsciously, in other words, that are in it because of the sin nature, things like worry, fear unbelief you don't you don't deliberately go and do them they 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 come out even sometimes before you think about it amen such sins are cleansed by just saying lord have mercy on me and the blood of jesus christ will just go into operation and it will cleanse you you know then there's sins that you commit consciously like holy spirit told you not to do it and then you do it because of you know pressure of the loss of the flesh and you know your own rebellion and desire and things like that those ones you have to confess you know and repent of them you know, and, 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 and so the, the mercy of God gives us the blood of Jesus to cleanse sin. The mercy of God, God gives us eternal life. The Bible says in the book of Jude. And then the mercy of God also gives us the power of God. You know, where the, uh, the Holy Spirit ministers to us from the outside. And it was actually, technically speaking, and accurately speaking, under the Old Testament, what they were preaching on was mercy. Grace was not yet available in the sense that grace came through Jesus Christ. Until Jesus died, shed his blood, and was raised again from the dead, nobody could actually access the grace of God that gets you born again. Say, by grace are ye saved. And that through, you know, through faith, you know, uh, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God. You know, by faith are you saved through grace. In other words, uh, uh, it's, the great, it's, the, it's the favor of God through the sacrifice of Jesus that gives us uh, uh, the life of God that gets our inner man recreated. That was not available on the Old Testament. So all the things you see in the Old Testament, oh, let me give an example. The Spirit of God came upon Sam, Samson. I remember, remember Samson. You know, and he was able to kill a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. That didn't come from inside, it came from outside. All the things we read in the Old Testament, they all came from the outside. And, and God spoke to Moses. The cloud was on the outside. You know, it affected the inside, but it was not resident in the inside. But now, in the New Testament, we now have the life and the power of God resident on the 
inside, guess what? And then we also still have the one that we have on the outside, double portion. Give a little clap offering. And so, you know, that's why it is one of the reasons why it is a better testament established among better promises. We have everything they had in the Old Testament. And then we have what they did not have in the Old Testament. And that's why we are supposed to outstrip. And this is a fact that is not real to many of us. Because of a lack of revelation and understanding concerning these things. We are supposed to completely outdo the Old Testament saints. In other words, everything they did, we are supposed to do and do it far better. And I've said this. And, and, and because of this, I'm going to come back to this uh, in just a minute, in how you present your body a living sacrifice and, and its consequence. But let's quickly go to uh, uh, Matthew chapter 5. A great scripture. Jesus is speaking, you know, and I believe it's verse 17. Verses 17 and 18. You know, the Lord Jesus makes this statement. You know, which is not real. Uh, rather, the, the, the understanding of it is not as uh, clear to many New Testament saints as it should be. He, though he was talking to the Jews, he was also talking to us prophetically. He said, think not, I didn't hear you, that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, watch what he said. Next verse. This, because they go together. You can't just read one verse and leave it. You've got to read the second verse to get what it says. For, say, for verily, you know, when it time Jesus says verily, he's about to say something that is so wonderful, that is so great, that ordinarily you may be inclined not to believe it is possible. So he prefaces it with verily or verily, verily, to let you know that this thing I'm telling you, you know, as... Wonderful as it sounds and unbelievable as it sounds is true. He says, he doesn't say that all the time, but whenever he says it, take note. He's about to say something that is, 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 is outstanding. Outstanding. Excuse me. He says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. Until all be fulfilled. Oh my goodness. Everybody shout all. Be fulfilled. I didn't hear you. Be, all what? Be fulfilled. I'll probably touch on this very briefly in my main message later on today. But I want you to understand this. Everything we read in the Old Testament. Are simply types and shadows. Of what we New Testament Christians are prophetically destined to fulfill. Let me be specific. You know, uh, and we're going to go back to Romans chapter 12 in a minute. You know that, you know, um, most Christians know and agree with what I'm about to say now. Christ is our Passover. So, Christ fulfilled the feast of Passover. When we accept Christ, we, you know, experience the spiritual significance of the feast of Passover. And then Pentecost, when we experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit and we speak in tongues, we experience in the spiritual fulfillment of what was written in the Feast of Pentecost. And then when we experience uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, which again is obscure to many people, but most people don't even know that there's a Feast of Tabernacles, and those who know, they don't really know what it spiritually signifies. It signifies, you know, uh, uh, the ingathering of the fruit of the Spirit, which is the perfection of love, and the consequent ingathering of the harvest of the nations, which I spoke about earlier on. You know, when it says the fullness of Christ, it's not just talking only about the numerical harvest of people coming in but the fullness of, of of the growth of the church into christ in all things now that feast of tabernacles you know its fulfillment requires the uh release the inheritance and the release of the power of the holy spirit without measure it cannot be done with the first fruits of the spirit which is what we get at pentecost now, everybody, you know, most people agree with these three uh, interpretations, and, and, and they're scripturally correct. But I'm, I'm going to go a step further. You need to understand that 
Something like, for example, Abraham, Moses, Joshua. They were all, they were actual human beings. They were actual, phys- you know, physical people that did the things that the Bible records that they did. Literally. However, we as New Testament Christians will now fulfill what is written about them. We will now fulfill it, you know, uh, uh, as a prophetic fulfillment in a greater way than what they did. That's what Jesus is saying here. He said that all of everything that is written is not just, it's not just the Feast of Passover and Te- Pentecost and Tabernacles alone, you know. And that's why you can go into the Old Testament and you can see all these different, all these different accounts that were written. And uh, like I shared when I was we talking a few weeks ago about Jehoshaphat, you know, and, and Asa and, and Hezekiah, you know, all this they're written for our, for our learning. We are, they're written so that we can fulfill the fullness of what was in God's heart when God did those things through those people. Because what we have as New Testament Christians is greater than what they had. The Bible says it is a better testament established upon better promises. So, in particular, you know, uh, uh, take Moses for instance. You know, let's see, because Moses is a very uh, uh, big figure in the Old Testament. You know, he wrote the Bible, he wrote the Torah. That's Genesis to Revelation, sorry, to Deuteronomy. You know, and then look at the works Moses did. Look at the miracles Moses did. Moses literally broke Egypt. He broke the stubbornness and the pride of Pharaoh. And finally, he got rid of his army in the Red Sea. Now, it was not Moses who did it. It was God who did it. But God did it through Moses. Now, such an event has not yet taken place in our modern age. But it's going to happen. The Bible tells us that. He said, we're going to break the nations. It's in the book of Revelation. He said, uh, you, know, you, will br- you know, I will give you a rod of iron, and with it you will break the nations. And he didn't say that only to Jesus. He said that to the overcomer. Why would we need to break the nations? If I was reviewing this today, you know, the Lord was speaking to me in my personal Bible reading and study, you know, that the nations are going to come against us. Jesus said so. In Matthew chapter 24, he said that, you know, uh, you will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. You know, yet the same Bible says a few verses down that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached unto all nations. How will they hate us and then allow us to preach the gospel unto all nations? Something's going to happen in between, breaking them. So what Moses did in Egypt was just a sample. We're going to see that now reproduced in many nations in the earth in this end time. So in that sense, we are going to be fulfilling what is written in the law about Moses. The same thing is true of Elisha. The same thing is true of Elijah. The same thing is true, you know, of all the Old Testament prophets. Everything you read about in the Old Testament can be and should be used as a shadow and a type of what we are now to fulfill in the Old Testament. And we can do it because we have what they had and more. In other words, the, 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 the power of the Holy Spirit that came upon them from the outside to do the things they did, we have that power and then we have the one also from the inside. That's why it's called a baptism. So when you baptize something, you, you, like, a, like a glass now, if you fill the glass with water, the glass is full of water but it's not baptized in water. But if you take that glass and put it inside a bucket, then inside the bucket, the Water in the bucket fills the glass, and then water surrounds the glass. Then the water, the glass is or tumbler is baptized in water. What we call the baptism of fire and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to fill us on the inside with the Spirit and then surround us on the outside with the Spirit. It is that baptism of the Spirit without measure that will now enable us. To fulfill all the law and the prophets. I shared this a few Sundays ago. You know, the law is love. When you fulfill, when you walk in love and you perfect the law of God, you fulfill all the law. 
when you fulfill all the law, you now inherit the spirit without measure. It is the spirit without measure that you will now use to fulfill the prophets. You have to divide it a little bit. You know, all this revelation came in the last few years. 2017, 2018, 2019. You know, this, so it's not just fulfilling the law of love, which it is, you know. But it now, fulfilling that law of love now qualifies us to inherit the spirit without measure. With which we can now fulfill all the prophets. So I can fulfill Isaiah. I can fulfill Jeremiah. I can fulfill um, Ezekiel. I can fulfill uh, Elijah, Elisha, Malachi, everything. Which is what the Bible is all about. All of those people that the Bible writes about. That's why the Bible says this. You know, that the spirit, the testimony of Jesus... Is the spirit of prophecy. Everything we read about, it was all pointing to Jesus Christ. Now, when you now grow into the fullness of Christ, then you are now able to fulfill all of those things. And that is what brings us back, let's get back to Romans 12 now, to what Paul is trying to tell us here. He said, I beseech you, I'm begging you, if let, let, me, let me say it in 21st century um, modern English that you, know, that you can appreciate. This is a paraphrase. I'm begging you, deal with your body. If you don't allow your body to become a living sacrifice, the glory of God on the inside can never come out on the outside and you will never remove the blindness on Israel. That's why I said, I beseech you, therefore. Present your body a living sacrifice. Because that's the way that the, the glory that is on the inside, that's what I preach in my New Year message, breaking through the veil of the flesh. You cannot, you see, it's already there, but it's veiled. It's covered by the sin nature that is still in the mind and the soul and the body, you know, and, and, and the flesh. So what is inside can't come out. And if it can't come out, they can't see it. And if they can't see it, the blindness can't be removed. I was writing one of my weekly ravers, this is, you know, some years ago, you know, and I said this manifestation of the glory of God will be like a spiritual supernova. How many people know what a supernova is? Well, I'll tell you. You know, when stars, you know, all this star, like our sun, our sun is actually a star, you know, uh, 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 it's, 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 it, uh, what is causing the light and the energy to come out of the sun is without going into too much physics, it's just helium, you know, and it's, you know, fusion of helium that is producing energy and producing heat and producing, you know, the, the temperature of the sun is about 93 million degrees Celsius. But after some years, all that helium is going to be used up. Now, when I say some years, it's a long time. <laughs> there are billions and billions and billions. You know, to cut a long story short, what happens is that when a star uses up all of its, all of its helium and all of that, you know, it has some other things inside like cobalt and iron and you know some these other. It's also a question of chemical um, um, reactions and a transmutation of 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 of, of, of uh, heavy elements. To cut a long story short, what happens is that the pressure that because when you bring something together, you are coming against the, uh, attra you know, the repulsive forces that, you know, positively charged um, particles repel each other. You know, then the ones that have opposite charges attract each other. Then you also have the force of gravity. You know, gravity, you know, you know gravity pulls it pulls you. If you drop, if you raise something up, it's going to come down. So the force of gravity is an attractive force. But the force of the nucleus of the protons, which are positively charged, is a repulsive force. Now, when a star collapses, what happens is that what is on the inside, all the protons and neutrons and all of that, you know, the, the, the repulsive force, because they're brought together in a very, you know, compact space. You know, it, it grows astronomically and then it overcomes the gravitational force and causes an explosion. 
And then, you know, it begins to, all the things that are inside, the cobalt, the iron, and all these other, you know, elements that have been formed on the inside are now distributed throughout, you know, the cosmos, you know, throughout the outer space and it's in its own local region. So what happens is this. It now flares up with light. That light is called a supernova. You can see it billions and billions and billions and billions of years. Light years. That is the amount of time it takes light to travel for one year. You know, hundreds of millions of light years are far off. Some of the things we're seeing today happened billions of years ago. We're just getting the light today. So, anyway, a supernova is something that just creates a, a great amount of light. Let's, let's, let me put it you know, in, in a simple way. When this glory comes, it will be a spiritual supernova. And that amount of light will dispel darkness. And that's why the Bible says the blindness is in part until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. So, how is this thing going to take place? It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, I've explained that, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, a holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, you see, this physical body, there's nothing wrong with it intrinsically, but because of the nature of sin... Because of sin, which we inherited from our parents. That's one of the reasons why Jesus was not born of a virgin. Sorry, that's one of the reasons why Jesus was born of a virgin. That's why Jesus was not born of a natural father. Otherwise, the sin nature would have been passed down to him through the bloodline. That's why he had to be born of a virgin. And then the, the egg in, in Mary's womb was fertilized by the power of the word of God that came from God. And that's why, in a sense, he's called the son of God. Now, of course, like I shared with you on Wednesday, that son of God is just a label. You know, he, that the son is just the person that decided to come to the earth, you know, uh, the second person of the Godhead to become, you know, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to make the sacrifice for us. So, that uh, 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 second uh, person of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus Christ, that came, made himself, you know, a sacrifice on our behalf. Now, what's happening is this. When we get born again, the divine nature is injected into the spirit. But the soul, which is made up of the mind, the will, and then the emotions, are not born again. The sin nature is still there. The Bible calls it the flesh. It's actually the sin nature in the flesh. The physical body is not born again. That's why you and I, as Christians, you know, until we learn how to grow and, and walk in the spirit... We have a struggle between the inner man that has the nature of God and the outer man that has the sin nature. The Bible says the flesh lost against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. That is why Paul is telling us here, yeah, learn and you have to learn it. And that's why you need instruction by coming to church like this and listening to these kind of messages. He says, you know, the, 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 learn how to use the power of the Holy Spirit that is inside you, the life of God that is available to you to remove the nature of sin, the residual nature of sin that is still inside the soul and the body. That's how you present your, your body a living sacrifice. The word living sacrifice there, you know, reminds us of the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the animal sacrifices were dead. In other words, they were killed and then they were now put on the altar and then, you know, they were burned, you know, they put fire under it, you know, and burned it. Now, Paul, and the Holy Spirit through Paul, is contrasting the dead animal sacrifices of the Old Testament with the living sacrifice of your physical body of the New Testament. So your, new, your, your physical body in the New Testament is not supposed to be killed physically. It is supposed to watch this. You are supposed to kill the sin nature inside it. You are not supposed to kill the body. But by the Spirit. He said, if ye through the Spirit do mortify. The word mortify just means to kill. You know, mortify the deeds of the flesh. Then you will live. So if you use the power of the Holy Spirit as a daily habit. Through prayer and intercession and groaning. That's where we get all of this stuff from. You know, you now crucify. You kill the sin nature inside the physical body and that sin nature when it is now being killed or crucified or 
dominated or removed or flushed out. The Bible says, having therefore these promises daily, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. The Bible uses the word kill. The Bible uses the word cleanse. They are metaphors that are just using to, that are being used to explain the fact that it's removed. Whether you kill it and then you clean it out. You know, when that thing happens, what happens is this. The life of God that is inside your spirit can now flow into the physical body and from there outwardly to be a blessing to the world. That's how Jesus blessed people. Rumor with the issue of blood. It was the life of God that was in Jesus. He, he, said, he said, virtue has gone out of me. It came from his spirit via his soul into the body and then into that woman's body and the woman was healed. I was reviewing those scriptures again over this weekend. You know, where the Bible says, it says in, it's in Mark chapter five, 6, verse 56, it says, and wherever he entered into country or villages, he says, as many as touched him, he said they were healed. In Luke chapter 6, verse 19, he said, virtue went out of him and healed them all. Because there was nothing blocking it. That's why he says, I beseech you, you and I, therefore brethren, that you, you and I, present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy accident. He said, if you do this, the power of God will come out of your body in such great measure. Let's, let's say it the way the Bible says it, without measure. Then it will now produce this kind of miracles, all these wonders. You know, what looks like a wonder to you, you and I now will now become normal. And that will now open the eyes of natural Israel. So they will no longer be blind in part. Say, so until this fullness comes in us. Verse 2. He says, and be not conformed to this world. Anytime you see the word world in the New Testament, put this on it. You, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, you know, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes and pride of life. And you get the correct understanding. Amen. The Bible says, love not the world. He's not, saying, he's not saying, let me say it in a joking kind of way. He's not saying, don't love England, don't love America, don't love Nigeria. You know, those are the countries in the world. He's not talking about the geographical countries in the world. He's not talking about the physical, uh, uh, the geography of the world. He's not saying, don't love mountains, don't love hills. Those are all the things that are inside the world. So, no, 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 no. He's not talking about that at all. He's talking about the way the world thinks. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So he says, don't be conformed. I didn't hear you. And be not conformed to this world. To, to, the, to the desires of the, of the flesh. The desires of the eyes or the mind. And the pride of life. Don't, don't, don't allow the world to put you in its mold. But be ye, be ye transformed. Everybody says transformed. By the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. This is a sequence. We delineate them. Uh, our fathers taught us that, you know, Kenneth Hagin, and even Jesus taught him that, you know, to show that there are three levels of the, of the will of God. There is the good will of God. There is the acceptable will of God. And, it's perfect. and, that, and that, that teaching is correct. But in this context, what Paul is actually saying is this. That if you will learn to renew your mind. Again, the sin nature is in the mind. That's why the mind is dark. That's why the mind cannot understand spiritual things. The Bible says, don't be like the unbelievers who in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. As Ephesians 4, I believe it's 17 or 18. You know, so the, 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 the mind, because of the sin nature in it, the mind is blind to spiritual things. Is because it's alienated. Once the life of God is not shining in the mind, the mind cannot receive spiritual things because just like watch this just like you need natural light to see physical things you need spiritual light to see spiritual things that's what we call revelation see people who cannot see spiritual things have don't have the life of god in their minds to any appreciable degree because the life of god contains the light of god jesus said you will walk in the light of life 
It's not the life of light. It's the light of life. The original substance is life. That life has in it light. So that light now enlightens our understanding so we can understand spiritual things so that the mind now, instead of being a block to the life of God that is inside, now becomes a clear channel. So watch this. You've got two things here. You've got the mind, the soul, which is the mind, the will, and the emotions, and then you've got the physical body. So Paul is telling us here to have a two-pronged attack. Present your body a living sacrifice, and as you're doing that, also renew your mind. When you do those two things, the power and the life of God that is inside the spirit can now flow via the mind, through the soul, into the physical body, and it will now prove experientially. In other words, it will be your experience, and other people from the outside will observe it. They will see you manifest. They will see you demonstrate, firstly, the good will of God. Then as you grow spiritually, you will now demonstrate the acceptable will of God. Then as you continue to grow spiritually, ultimately you will now demonstrate the perfect will of God. That's what he's telling us. That you may prove. You will prove it. You will prove it. By allowing those two things to happen. Your mind to be renewed. And your body to be sanctified. That's where we are. You know, sanctification just sounds like a you know, legalistic holiness word. But that's really what it means. Where, where the body is now, the, 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 the life of God is now made manifest, that's how Paul describes it, in the mortal flesh. But you see, it cannot be done if the mind is not renewed. The mind will always act as a block because the life of God, watch this, does not come directly from the spirit to the body. It comes from the spirit via the mind. The will and the emotions dead into the physical body. That's how this transaction is made. And so, what Paul is telling us here is that we as Christians have to understand our assignment. Our assignment firstly and primarily is to renew our minds with the word of God and renew our bodies with the life of God. Then prove by experience and demonstration and manifestation, the good, the acceptable, and ultimately the perfect will of God. I want to drop this with us as I begin to close. The church for these 2,000 years since Jesus left has only seen the good and the acceptable will of God. Church has not proved the perfect will of God. That's why people don't believe in perfection. <laughs> Some of us, by the grace and the mercy of God, believe in it because we just accept the testimony of God's word. But it's not because we've seen anybody who's done it. The only person we've seen who's done it is Jesus. Not even Paul and, and the apostles. They talked about it. They wrote about it. They got revelation. We're reading from Paul here. You know? But we never actually saw it in demonstration on a consistent basis. Therefore, it has created in our hearts and minds skepticism, unbelief, that is it possible? Yes, I know the Bible says so. But nobody's done it. We haven't, we haven't seen it in, in manifestation. Therefore, the carnal mind, as it always does, because it's in enmity against God, puts it off to the resurrection. And says, well, okay, well, you know, because nobody has ever done it, Paul didn't do it, Peter didn't do it, you know, they wrote about it. You know, Paul said, I am not yet perfect, but I pressed toward the mark. You know, he said, not as though I had attained or already were, were perfect. He saw it, but he said, well, uh, if this is the thinking. You know how we think? <laughs> if a whole Paul, if a whole Paul did not, was not able to attain it, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament? Who is small, Olubi? To ever think that we can get it. So, okay, when we get the resurrection, when Jesus comes, we will have it. But in this life, we will not have it, which is directly contrary to Scripture. The Scripture says, as He is, so are we in this world. 
The same scripture written by the same Paul says that the life of God be made manifest in our mortal flesh, not our resurrected flesh. Not our glorified flesh, the mortal one. The one, the same one that was in Jesus. You see, one thing we need to understand, I'm going to close on with, with these thoughts. One thing we all need to understand is this. Jesus did not perform the miracles he performed in a glorified body. He performed it in a natural body. And to take that argument a little bit further, what we need to understand is this. He performed all of those things in a natural body, you know, which was subject to the same limitations that our natural body is subject to. How many of you know Jesus was tired? Yet through that tired body, the glory of God was flowing. When he went to the woman at the, at the well of Samaria, the Bible says he being wearied. So Jesus got tired. You know, you walk five miles in the sun, in the desert, you get tired. So he didn't have a, a, a body that was uh, superlative, that was, you know, that was unnatural. You know, if you, you, you get the wrong end of the stick, if you don't go back to the scriptures and accept what the scripture says. The Bible says he fasted for 40 days and he was hungry. Okay, okay, he was on a fast. One day he was coming, back. I'm talking about that today because this is our Passion Week. You know, he was coming, he was coming from Bethany in the morning and he saw a fig tree. The Bible says he was hungry. It was in the morning, he hadn't had breakfast. Hello. So he felt hungry. So he went to the tree to go and look for figs. He didn't find any, so he cursed it. Another message for later t- this today. But I want you to understand something. That body was a natural body. Is that same body that was hungry, that, you know, that, 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 that was looking for the, f- the figs on the fig tree, was the same body, the Bible says, virtue went out of him and healed them all. So it's a natural body, like you and me. So, it, we, we will be telling ourselves a lie and we'll be doing ourselves a disservice to believe that it is not possible in this life. That's why Jesus is the prototype that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Give the Lord a clap offering. He did it. So, if we, by the help of the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, will learn to renew the mind... And present the body a living sacrifice. Then we too, like Jesus, can do the same. No wonder why he said that. The works that he did and greater. And your body, watch this. Your body that will have the life of God flowing through it without measure. That will instantly heal the sick. Instantly raise lep- uh, cleanse lepers, instantly raise the dead, like it was in the ministry of, like it was in the life of Jesus. Virtue will go out of you and heal everybody in your environment. Because I'll, I'll heal them all. And we're talking about five thousand people, fifteen thousand people, twenty thousand people. Oh, how that will change everything! Are you following me? That is what we're looking for. That's what's called revival. That's what we're calling the manifestation of the, the word. The sons of God have been there. You know, it does not yet appear what we shall be. But when he shall appear, you know, we shall see him as he is. You know, and we shall become like him. It's not only about the resurrection. Now, I'm going to close with this thought. And there's a very important point. The Holy Spirit made it clear to me about four or five years ago. You know, three, four years ago. On this issue. You know, I, I used to confuse the terms. When I say confused, I, I knew it was there, but I didn't lay my hand on it properly until recently. We are talking about the transformation of the physical body, not the resurrection of the physical body. So you have one an assignment in your Christian life. You are supposed not only... To transform your mind, you're supposed to transform your body. And that word transform comes from the Greek word metamorpho, from which we get the English word metamorphosis. And there is nothing else that describes this truth that I'm telling you 
about our growth in Christ into perfection than the metamorphosis of the butterfly. No wonder God allowed the scientists to use that word metamorphosis to describe the development of the butterfly from the egg to the butterfly. And, and, and when you understand this, it gives you understand. The Bible says, the invisible things of him are clearly seen. Being understood, this is how we understand it, by the things that are made. The butterfly was made by God. Now, what happens? You get born again, the, the seed of God. is The Bible says, you're born of not corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. That's like that butterfly when it's an egg. Then, it gives birth. Then it becomes a caterpillar. A caterpillar doesn't look anything like the butterfly. But it is the butterfly. Huh. I just got a word, Pastor G. The butterfly is inside the caterpillar. Christ in you, the hope of glory. But caterpillar? Christ is in you. The butterfly is inside the caterpillar. But sadly and regrettably, Majority of the church has lived and died as butter, as, as caterpillars. So all we've seen for 2,000 years, from the time of Christ till today, most of what we've seen have been caterpillar Christians. So we all think caterpillar is normal. And Satan has told us that you can never get beyond caterpillar. Yes, you will go to heaven, doesn't argue with us about that. Caterpillar goes to heaven. He's a child of God. Using this illustration. But, you know, God doesn't want us to remain caterpillar. God wants the world to see the butterfly. But to move from the caterpillar to the butterfly, you have to go into the purple stage or the chrysalis. That they call it like that. You know, and that's the one that people don't understand. The thing now becomes dormant. It's as if nothing is happening. But that parallels Jesus' life. We see the caterpillar when he's 12, moving around, so to speak. Then you see him enter the purple stage between 12 and 18. Oh, sorry, between 12 and 30. It's 18 years. It's as if nothing's happening. But plenty is happening. He's going to the synagogue every day. The Bible says, as his custom was. He's praying. The Bible says, in the days of his flesh, he offered up prayer and supplication. He's working in the carpenter's shop. As his, with, with his dad, you know, uh, his stepfather, Joseph. He's growing. The Bible says he's growing wisdom and in stature. But there was no external miracles, nothing. Then at 30, the butterfly comes out. The spirit without measure comes upon him and says, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He goes to the wilderness, you know, for 40 days. He overcomes. He's tested with the loss of the flesh, loss of the eyes, and pride of life. He overcomes all of them. Be not conformed to this world. Then the Bible says, He returned in the power of the spirit. And he goes to Cana of Galilee. He turns water to wine. And from then on, it doesn't end. The Bible says, If all the miracles Jesus did were to be written, the world will not be able to contain the books. Now, you know what? Everything I've just said applies to you. Oh, if you can't say amen, say oh me somebody. That's what it's all about. That's what Paul is saying in these two verses. He's telling us that you, by the mercy, you can't do it by yourself. You're going to need the mercy of God. That's why you need the constant cleansing of the blood of Jesus. Constant, you know, receiving of life, you know, in, into the inner man. Receiving of power from the outer man. So you pray in tongues, you know, walking in the spirit, praying in the spirit, you know, uh, praying in all kinds of prayer in the spirit, reading your Bible, meditating on the word of God. All of these things, that's what will now renew your mind. And then as you pray a lot in the spirit, you know, take up your cross daily. That cross is not a physical cross. It's, it's using the power of the Spirit. He, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body. If you pray a lot in the Spirit and crucify, use the power of the Spirit that's coming out of you. That's where groaning comes in. Praying in tongues comes in. You crucify the sin nature in the flesh. What are you doing? You're using the mercies of God to present your body a living sacrifice. You are renewing your mind so you experientially you can prove demonstrate manifest initially the good will of god 
You know, the good will of God is everybody now sees you've changed. You don't smoke anymore. You don't drink anymore. You don't, you know, fornicate. And the things you used to do before you became a Christian. That's good. But don't stop there. Then you move to the acceptable will of God. You get baptized in the Holy Spirit and you speak in tongues. Hallelujah. That's a little bit higher than the good. You know, oh, something supernatural is happening here. All right? You're, you're speaking in tongues. You know, you cast out devils. You lay hands on the sick and they recover. You're getting revelation knowledge. You're speaking a lot of nice things from the word of God. People say, ah, where did he get all of that from? And they can see it. It's proven. But then there is the last one. The perfect will of God. That's the one we haven't seen. Where the life of God is made manifest in the mortal flesh. Where like Jesus, stand to your feet. we got to close. Like Jesus. Not any less. See, Jesus didn't do the things he did as God. He didn't. He did them as a man. How God anointed Jesus Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Who went about doing good. Healing those who were oppressed of the devil. He didn't do it as a man. He did it, sorry, he didn't do it as God. With omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. No! He did it as a man. With the same limitations as men. To prove this. I just got a word. Look at what happened in Nazareth. He couldn't do any mighty work there. If it was doing it as God, it, would, it, would, it wouldn't have mattered. There were no mighty works. There was no cleansing of lepers. There was no raising of dead in Nazareth. The Bible said because of their unbelief. And I want you to know something. I'm just telling you this up front. When this spirit without measure comes into manifestation, it will only work on people who believe. If you speak evil, but Jesus said, if any man speaks evil of me, he cannot do any mighty work. If you, you know, and you have a wrong. The Bible says because of their unbelief. The way their attitude to him blocked the flow of the power of God. But whereas you find in Bethsaida, you find in Capernaum, you find in Chorazin, and these other places, the Bible says great miracles were happening. And that's why I'm going to do that now also as I close. You know, I always have people, you know, just stretch forth your hand and say, I believe I receive. That's what God needs. And you get your healing. Look at the, look at, look at the woman with the issue of blood. She didn't even, she didn't even pray. She prayed. You don't misunderstand me. But what I mean is that she, all she just did was believe. She had heard reports. Then she made the contact and believed. And without Jesus' permission, she doesn't even know who it was. The life of God, because it was already there. Once the power of God is available for people who would believe. And you know, it was Derek Prince who was saying to some people. He said, the reason why you're making an argument is because you're not yet desperate. You know, when you have an issue and you're not desperate, you can bring all kinds of intellectual like But when you are desperate, like the woman with the issue of blood, who was dying, she didn't care what anybody thought. She didn't care whether she was caught. She knew, well, I can't go. But if I stay, I'm going to die anyway. So if I go into the crowd and they catch me and they kill me, well, but let me take my chances. And she did. And she touched the hem of his garment and power flowed and instantly, glory to God, she was healed. And there are people like that today. They are beggars in Songo. They don't care about all this, you're intellectual. Once the power of God is in manifestation and they hear the report, they will come and get it. And it doesn't, they, they, you don't need to have any big theology. You don't need to know too much Bible. Like the, the, the centurion, he didn't know anything. He just said, speak the word only. And my servant shall be healed. And Jesus said, so be it. He said, your faith, you know, I've not seen such great faith. No, not in Israel. The Syrophoenician woman, her daughter was, was, was in, 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 under demonic oppression. She came, cried, Jesus didn't even answer her. I think that would have offended most people. And Jesus said, you don't understand. I'm only sent for now. This will be paraphrased. For now, I'm only sent to the sheep of Israel. You're not an Israelite. You're a, so I don't have any legal basis to minister unto you. I'm giving you a paraphrase. You know, the woman said, yes, you're right, correct. But even dogs get the crumb from the table. Jesus said, man, I can't deny that. She's got, you got it. And the woman, the, instantly, 
she did she was a Syrophoenician she didn't know the Bible she didn't have one big theological faith she only believed what the master said she just believed what the word God said and guess what she got her miracle if you will believe this morning you're going to get your miracle simple faith don't don't complicate it keep it simple let's talk to God let's talk to God I want you this morning to say God for you who's the Christian the born again spiritual Christian you've seen the good will of God you've seen the acceptable will of God speaking in tongues and and some degree of the supernatural but that's not where we're supposed to stop we're not supposed to crash there we need to move on now to the perfect will of God. Prove it! Demonstrate it! Manifest it! And you know what? That's going to shut the mouth of everybody. Nobody's going to say that that Bible is not true. All those people are fake. You know, there will be too many proofs. <laughs> too much. There will be too many evidences. Now, some people still won't believe, but that's... That God would have done his own bit. Let's talk to God. Put one hand on your heart. Raise the other hand to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to continue our study in the book of Romans. We're in Romans chapter 12. And in our last lesson we ended, I believe, with verse 2. Where, you know, Paul, well, verse 1 and 2, they really go hand in hand. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, or that translation says, which is your spiritual service. And don't be conformed to the world as the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life, but be transformed. That is the word metamorpho, you know, where we get English word metamorphosis from, by the renewing of your mind, so that you might prove experientially and gradually sequentially firstly what is the good secondly what is the acceptable and ultimately what is the perfect will of god and all i'll just do now is just to remind us of the fact that this is what god uh wants the church to do you know and these three there's a beautiful principle here of three aspects of the will of god there's the good will of god there's the acceptable will of god and there's the perfect will of god in this particular context, Paul was talking about the fact that we should present the physical body as a living sacrifice in contrast to the dead sacrifices of the Old Testament where they would kill an animal, you know, uh, like a bullock or a goat, and then they will, it would be dead. And they will put it on the altar and then the fire, you know, will burn it and it will rise up as a sweet-smelling server to God. In the New Testament, our bodies are supposed to be living sacrifices. They're not dead, they're living. But what we're supposed to do is similar to what they did in the Old Testament, except that it is spiritual. We're supposed to use the fire of the power of the Holy Spirit to burn out the sin nature that is inside the soul and in the body, and that, that will now rise up as a sweet-smelling servant to God. That's why he said, this is your reasonable or your spiritual worship. That, in other words, this is the spiritual equivalent of what was done in the Old Testament. And the uh, consequence of this is that it will transform you. So that, you know, uh, you will experience sequentially, you know, the uh, w will of God. Firstly, the good will of God, which is what all of us experience when we get born again. When you get born again, you know, it's good. But it's not, that's not where we're going. You know, that's not the ultimate you know, in our Christian lives. And the acceptable will of God, we get baptized in the Holy Spirit, and we speak in tongues. We have the Holy Spirit. In fact, when we got born again, we have the Holy Spirit. Whether you speak in tongues or not, everybody who is born again has the Holy Spirit inside them. It's just a measure. So you now move to a higher measure where you get the Holy Spirit in a measure that is sufficient to enable you to speak in a supernatural language, you know, and, 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 and so you have more of the Holy Spirit in your life than you had which is now the acceptable will of God. But ultimately, what God wants us to get to is where we experience the, what the Bible calls the spirit without measure, where the life of God is made manifest in our mortal flesh in full measure. Observe that when you speak in tongues, that's the life of God being made manifest in your mortal flesh. Because your physical body, you know, your physical tongue that is talking. So thank God for that. But that's not God's 
ultimate. His ultimate is for that life of God to be made manifest in our mortal flesh in its fullness. So much so, it will produce the same results we see in the ministry of Jesus. And uh, one very outstanding characteristic of that is revealed in Malachi, as it's in chapter 4, it's in verse 2. He says, Unto you that fear my name, says, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. The characteristic of the life of God, let me put it this way. The initial evidence of the earnest of the Spirit, which is also the deposit of the Spirit, baptism of the Holy Ghost, is speaking in tongues. The initial evidence of the life of God being made manifest in your mortal flesh is that it will get people healed instantly. That's the initial evidence. And that's what you see in the ministry of Jesus. You know, after he did the uh, miracle in Cana of Galilee, you know, then there was this uh, uh, nobleman's son who was sick. Jesus just sent the word. The Bible says he began to amend, you know. And then later on, you know, he was in Capernaum in the temple. There was a man who had an unclean spirit. He said, shut up. <laughs> that's the English, the modern translation. The King James says, hold thy peace. Jesus says, shut up. <laughs> in Hebrew, you know, Aramaic, you know, and come out of him. And instantly that, that happened. And the people were shocked. They said, wow, what new doctrine is this? That very afternoon, they left the house, they left the temple. They go to Peter's house. His mother in law was sick with a fever. Jesus goes up to her, you know, and, and really the way the sequence, because I've, I've, by the grace and the mercy of God, I've tried to study these things very deeply. You know, and, 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 and concisely so that I can follow the pattern. I don't want to jump ahead of God and I don't want to be behind him. I want to follow the pattern. You know, you know, they actually, it was not Jesus who went to meet the woman. Jesus came into the house with his disciples. And Peter got home. And of course, you know, they want to serve Jesus and give him food and his disciples. That time there were only six of them. By that time there was not twelve of them. It was John... Andrew, James, uh, Bartholomew, Philip, and Peter. Six of them. You know, so they, 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 they got to Peter's house and they, you know, going to have lunch. And Peter's wife, of course, must have been running around. And I'm sure, you know, they now say, ah, mommy is not feeling well. That's Peter's mother-in-law, you know. So they come to Jesus and come to ask him, say they besought him for her. They, they came to ask him, say, please, can you pray for her? How did they know? They saw what happened in the temple. They saw what happened in Cana of Galilee. So they knew that power was available now. That wasn't available maybe, you know, a few weeks before. So he now, he, the Bible says he goes to her. He does three things. He rebukes the fever. Then he holds her by the hand. Number two, and then he causes her, you know, he drags her up. Not drag, but, you know, he lifts her up. Three things. You know, the first thing is he spoke. He rebuked the fever. So when we minister, this is something we can learn, you know, we're supposed to speak. So whenever I pray for people, I speak to the something. I say, you... I, due to the spirit behind it and the infirmity, and I command it to leave. But you don't stop there, you know. And then after you do that, you uh, 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 encourage the people to act in faith. She, he took her by the hand. The Bible says, and the fever left her. And she got up immediately. That's the characteristic of the spirit without measure. It was instant. And she served them. So, that's where God wants us to get to, where the life of God is made a manifest in our mortal flesh, and we can, you know, minister to the to the sick and get instant results. You know, uh, let me just say this: What's going to happen with this glory of God, this manifestation of which we speak that is coming, is that it's going to be in sharp contrast to what has existed before. See, what what we've had before is this spirit with measure. And occasionally, when the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of healings are in, we see instant healings. But it's occasional. It is, you know, it doesn't happen on a consistent basis. And because of this, sadly and very regrettably, some people try and fake it. You see people trying to, you know, fake 
healings, fake, you know, or make people do things that, you know, that sometimes will be embarrassing or will not be effective, you know, try and make them, you know, you know, walk when they can't walk and person will fall down and all of that. Now, I know some people do that like Smith Wigglesworth and then ultimately the person walks. But, you know, you've got to have that level of anointing in operation for you to try that. Don't, don't try and do things like that. What you should do is what the Bible says. You know, you rebuke the thing, you speak to it, and you encourage the person. If the power is there, it will be instant. They will get up. You don't have to try and cajole them or push them. or Don't, don't get into stuff like that. Praise the Lord. You know, I was looking at somebody recently, and they were, you know, trying to make somebody who was blind to see. And, you know, it, 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 it can get, you know. And then, of course, if you continue that kind of thing, you can open the door to evil spirits. And then the manifestation will no longer be God. It will now be the devil, you know. When it's there, it's there. Are you listening to me? You don't have to try and... You see, in Jesus' ministry, you don't see him trying to get people to do things. He will just minister to them and it will be instant. The few times, like this case of Peter's mom, uh, or mother-in-law, and um, uh, the, 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 the man who was bl- born blind... He did what the Holy Spirit told him to do. He took sand from the ground. He spat on it. He put it on the guy's eyes. He said, go and wash. Very simple. Incidentally, Jesus didn't follow him to where he went to wash. And say, when you wash, oh, you do it like this. Uh, yeah, open your eye. <laughs> you know, all this, you know, it's all, a, you know, because we don't have the spirit with, without measure. So we're trying to force something. The Bible said the man went, he washed, and he came seeing. Jesus already even left the place. So everybody said, ah, is it not you? He said, it's me. Ah, they were shocked. They said, who? T-? They said, well, a man called Jesus told me to go and wash, and I wash, and I'm seeing. You know, what I'm saying is that when this life of God is made manifest in the mortal flesh, it will produce instant healings of the sick, instant cleansing of lepers. That's another good example. The leper comes to Jesus. Jesus didn't go to the leper. The leper came to him and said, if you're willing, um, you can make me heal. He didn't, he didn't do anything. He just, he just said, I, I will. You know, and I think he laid hands on him and that's it. The Bible says the leprosy left him. Instant. That's where we're going. So that's why you want to make your body what? A living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto him. So, we go to verse 3 today. It says, for I say, I didn't hear you. For I say, I didn't hear you. That's better. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself (laughs) more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man. Everybody say, every man. There's every man in Jesus, not, not every human being, you know. The measure of faith. Then he explains why we have to have, I like the word soberly. And not thinking of yourself more highly than we ought to. I want to say this, I think I mentioned it in my last lesson, you know, but I didn't get into the depth of it. You know, one of the biggest problems in the church today is people thinking of themselves more highly than they ought. Now, observe, the Bible says you shouldn't think of yourself highly. Because, see, once you come into Christ, God has, has raised you together with Jesus Christ. So, you are truly in a high position. But you must not think of yourself more highly than you ought. But you should think of yourself soberly. Why? Because it is not only you who has been raised high. So many people, the whole body has been raised high. So so just as God gave you the measure of faith, He also gave other people the measure of faith. So don't think that you maybe you are higher than somebody else, you know, because how do you know? The only person who really knows what our relative positions are is God. See, I can think I am something when I am nothing. I can think I am an apostle when I'm not an apostle. (laughs) You know, I can think, you know, I am the anointed one to come when I'm not. You know, and and, and I'm going to deal with this today. You need to think of yourself, and I'm going to show you how to do it by the help of the Holy Spirit. You know, you need to think of yourself soberly. 
Because you are not the only member of the body of Christ. There's so many other people. And you know, in your own little corner here, you may think you're really something, but God has some other people somewhere you don't even know. So that's why you need to think of yourself soberly. Because you, you have so many Christians. The body is made of many members. I've learned that and I'm still learning it. You know, no matter what revelation you have, no matter how you know much you have grown, there may be some people out there, you, and you may not know them. And you may never meet them until when we get to heaven. And then God will now be telling you that, you know, what you thought you were, you weren't really there. This other guy was there. <laughs> Hello, somebody. So it is wiser to stay humble. That's why he said, but, you know, give you soberly. Because it's not only you God gave the measure of faith to. He gave the measure of faith to other people. And you don't know how they have used their own. You see, another thing we must not do is to judge according to appearance. You see, you see somebody, you know, maybe they have a big church, and they have a big ministry, and maybe they have an aeroplane, and, and they have a nice car, and they have a lot, and there's nothing wrong with all of that. You know, don't misunderstand me. God takes the pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. And then you see, another, you see another person who may not have all of those things, the external trappings. And then you now begin to judge and compare and think, oh, this one is more anointed than this one. Who told you? Think soberly. Judge not according to appearance. Because you don't know. You don't, you, you don't know what God's doing in, in, in the lives of the people. I want to give honor to, and tribute to the memory of Kenneth Hagen. As I'm talking now, I'm just being reminded by the Holy Spirit. He said, Kenneth Hagin was only 34 years old when I first appeared to him in 1950. He was born in 1917. So he was, you know, 1950, he was 33, going to 34 years old. At that time, I'm telling you, let's think soberly, according to God's measure of faith. Kenneth Hagin was not the most prominent minister in America. He was not. In fact, he was relatively unknown. <laughs> not that people didn't know him, but he was relatively unknown because he'd been, he'd been pastoring. He pastored one church in East Texas, pastored another one, and his church wasn't big. His church was maybe two, three hundred people. I don't even think it was up to that. It was a very small church. You know, but he was, God was using him greatly. And his faith had developed. It was 1949. The Holy Spirit once reminded me of this. It's not in my notes. 1949, the Holy Spirit began to lead him to start praying the Pauline prayers, particularly Ephesians chapter 1, that God would give him the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of. He prayed it morning, afternoon, and night. He did consistently for six months. This is his testimony. He said in six months, he got more revelation than he got in 14 years of ministry. Now, at this time, Greg was just, he was just a, like a small pastor, if you will quote, you know. But of all the people in America Jesus could appear to, he appeared to that small pastor. Can you believe? Give the Lord a clap offering. To that pastor that nobody probably reckoned with at that time. This, nine, this is 1950. Then he appeared to him again in 1952. Then he appeared to him again, you know. Over the years, 1959, in the 1960s, and all of that. At that time, people like William Branham, people like Oral Roberts, and, and others were far more prominent than Kenneth Hagin. Now, Kenneth Hagin, was, he, had, he had gifts of healings in his ministry. People got healed, and all that. But not at the level of people like William Branham, or people like Oral Roberts, or A. A. Allen, and others. Now, the Holy Spirit is reminding me about this. He said, but what I, what I said and I brought through Kenneth Hagin was so vital for the church. When I look back now in history, and I look at my own personal growth and experience, and not just Olubi Johnson, but, you know, the body of Christ. You know, because some of these other men, I also read their works. I read what they, what they wrote down. It wasn't at the same level. 
But if you are to judge the thing on the surface, you will put them on a higher pedestal than getting taken. And that's why you must not judge according to appearance. Are you listening to me? You've got to judge according to substance. Of all, you know, he, 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 he taught him so many wonderful things, the Lord Jesus. And each time Jesus appeared to Kenneth Hagen, he was teaching. The, he appeared to some of these other guys too, but they would just see him for five seconds or for a minute. And then maybe he would just lay hands and they would get sick, they would get healed and he would disappear. But Kenneth Hagen was different. He taught him, he taught him systematically. That tells me a lot. And I, I'm using examples of men who have died and gone to heaven. So there's no question of, you know, um, um, inflating their ego or anything. And that's why I said I'm giving it, you know, in honor of his memory. You know, and they're in heaven now. They can, they're, they're, they're watching what we're saying. Now, the, the, the point is this. You cannot look at something on the surface. Jesus said it this way. He says, judge not appearance according to appearance. Once somebody came to Jesus and said to him, said, good master, what shall I do to have done that? You know what Jesus said? He said, why callest thou me good? Of course Jesus was good. But Jesus was rebuking him, you know, nicely by saying, how do you know I'm good? Just because you see me. The only thing that makes men good is the amount of God they have in them. Now Jesus had it. But what Jesus was, he was correcting the mistake all of us make. We judge things on the surface. And then we, in our minds and in our thinking, you know, that's why I say, do not think of yourself more highly. You begin to think of yourself more highly than what God has really given you based on the appearance and what you can see. It's a big mistake. Always think soberly recognize that as God is walking in you, He's also walking in other people. You're not the only one. You know, let me say it this way, in a nice way that will puncture your ego. <laughs> You're the only one you know. <laughs> you don't know what other people are doing. And do, do, do you know what God is doing in China? Do you know what He's doing in Iran? Do you know what He's doing in England? Do you know what He's doing in America? The ones you know are the ones that are big. But how, 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 how do you know what God is doing to some people you don't even know? It's a great lesson. So, the Bible tells us, he said, let him think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. And, and God's working in so many people. In so many places that you don't know. A lot of people don't even know something like me exists. They don't know. You know, so how can you judge? There's only one way to judge. And I'll tell you how. Use the measure of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, if you use Jesus as your yardstick, you will never think of yourself more highly than you ought. You'll be able to think soberly. See, if I'm using Pastor X or Mr. Y as my yardstick, I might start thinking that, oh, maybe I'm better than him here. and that, uh, he said, All that is relative because I don't even know what God is doing in his heart. I don't know what God, because I'm not God. So I can't see everything. But if I use Jesus as my yardstick, no matter how big I am or I think I am, <laughs> you know, or no matter how successful I think I am, whenever I make my comparison with Jesus, it humbles me. That's the secret. So let the Lord Jesus, uh, be your yardstick. I got something here I wrote in my notes. Don't think more highly of yourself because we are many members. The Bible speaks about the length, breadth, depth, and height of the body of Christ. Recognize that God gives all of us the same measure of faith. Watch this. And your position in the church, in the body, is relative and dynamic. Now I'm going to, that's a mile deep. Let me unravel it. In other words, when you get born again, you're, 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 you're engrafted into the church. Christ is the vine, we are the branches. Now he has millions of branches or members. So he puts you in a particular position. Now you won't know that position, God does. 
relative to the rest of the body. Now, as you begin to grow, your position, that's why I say it's dynamic. Dynamic means it changes. As you begin to grow, your position in the body begins to change. Depending on what God, who sees, the only person that sees the whole picture is the Holy Spirit. So, he will now put you in a position depending on your development of growth. Again, what I'm going to do is let me use the example of the Apostle Paul. Paul gets born again and he's a baby. And God plugs him in in Damascus. He goes to Jerusalem. They don't understand him. Barnabas calls him, you know, and takes him under his wing and says, look, he's for real. Because he used to persecute and, 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 and throw the people in jail and everything. So the brethren were afraid of him. So Barnabas became his friend. You know, and Barnabas now said, oh, you know, he's not, he's not, he's not pretending. He's true. So they, they accepted him. And then he and Barnabas left. You know, they left Jerusalem. And they went to uh, uh, Antioch, you know. And then he went to Arabia for some years. And he was praying and stuff. And then God gave him revelation. He said, no man taught me. Then he comes back. And him and Barnabas and some other brethren, they went in Jerusalem. They were in Antioch. You know, and... In Antioch, the Bible says there were certain prophets and teachers, including Paul. During those years, Paul grew tremendously. He actually outgrew a lot of the brethren in Jerusalem. Not all of them, but a good number of them. So much so, that even Barnabas, his mentor, (laughs) Paul had outgrown him, so to speak. So when They were now fasting and praying in Antioch in Acts chapter 13. The Holy Ghost says, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul to the work to which I have called them. You know, and uh, and then, you know, they separated them. And then they went on their first missionary journey, you know, with the apostolic anointing. And you see the great things that they did. The Bible says that, you know, later on, much later on, you know, there was an argument between them because of John Mark. And Barnabas split off. I guess, I guess Barnabas thought, who, who does Paul think he is? You know, was it not us who, 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 who um, followed him up when he first got born again? And now he's, now he's you know. But yet God had chosen Paul. Now, didn't, didn't God choose Barnabas? He chose Barnabas too. Don't misunderstand me. But, you know, the position had changed. Now, for you to start judging Paul the way you judged him when he was in Damascus, <laughs> at that time, was a great mistake. And you know what? None of Barnabas' epistles were in the canon. He wrote epistle. There's an epistle of Barnabas. It never entered the canon. It was in the Apocrypha. You know, it was Paul's letters that entered the canon. It's God who chooses all. No wonder why the man wrote this. He said, don't think of yourself more highly. But think soberly. You may think you are something when you are nothing. You may think you are at a particular position when you are not. Let God be the one to vindicate you. Don't look for the, for the accolades and the promotion of men. Men can give you certificates. Men can talk about you. But what is heaven saying about you? That's, that's what I learned from this. Then This morning, right here in my office... As I was praying, the Holy Ghost just said something to me on this same thing. And I just wrote it here with my, with my Bible. He says, remember James and John. The reason why James and John asked their mommy to come and ask Jesus that one should sit on his left and the other should sit on <laughs> It sounds so funny now. The Lord Jesus Christ himself is laughing in heaven as I'm talking. You know? Because he, he's just chuckling, and I'm chuckling along with him. You know? And that's why he just looked at them. He shook his head. He said, <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you, don't know what you're, you don't know what you're talking about. <clears throat> that's what happens when you think of yourself more highly. Lord, let us sit at your right hand. Are you the only ones in the body of Christ? Are you the only disciples? The man has 12 disciples. But forget the 12 disciples, brethren. If you sit at God's left hand and right hand, where are you going to put Joseph? (laughs) Where will you put Enoch? Where are you going to put Moses? Where are you 
you going to put Elijah and Elisha and Isaiah? Think soberly. You are not the only one. Think soberly. <clears throat> so the Lord said, <clears throat> I should share this with you. <clears throat> he said, I, he was speaking to me, but I'm going to make it general for everybody. He said, your ambition should never be to be more than somebody else. He said, that was the problem. When you come to your kingdom, let, let me sit at your right hand and your left hand. You know, that's why the other two, the remaining ten were very angry with them. You know, if James and John, the sons of thunder, are the right and left, where are you going to put Peter? So Peter himself was indignant. He said, they were, what's wrong with you, these silly boys? That's what comes when you compare yourselves among yourselves and you measure amongst yourself. So the Lord said this to me. He said, let your ambition never be to be better than any other human being. Let your ambition be to become like me. That is your proper spiritual ambition. To be conformed to the image of Jesus. Now I've got good news for you. Oh, when I get to heaven and by the grace of God, I get conformed to the image of Jesus. You too get conformed to the image of Jesus. You know, then Jesus will now decide where everybody is going to be. And watch this. Your position in God is secure. God, nobody can take the place God has made for you. So stop trying to compete. And stop trying to be better than this other person or that other person. Try to become like Jesus. Now when you become like Jesus, everything that accrues to you in the kingdom will be yours. And nobody can take it away from you. Then he gave me another beautiful thought. I've said all this before I go into all of the other, but I will, I will deal with other things. Some of it today, maybe next, in my next lesson. You know, he said to me, he said, why do you think we have 24 elders? Have you thought about it? <laughs> These are mysteries. You know what 24 is? It's 12 times 2. <laughs> and 12 is God's number for government. When God rules, yes. He consults with them. And the Lord said to me, he said, over eternity, different sets of people will come and take those seats. That's why the Bible says, you and I are raised together, we're seated together with Christ. Where? In heavenly places. Don't worry, your seat is secure. Chill. <laughs> Chill. And stop trying to, you know, fight for this and fight for that. That's why Jesus says, he said, hmm. He said, can you drink of the cup? I will drink of it. Said, yes, I said, you will. And they did, both of them. You know, James was killed, but John, you know, he drank the cup, but he was able to uh, survive it. The wicked one was not able to destroy him. He lived a long life. You know, he said, and Jesus, he, he affirmed it. He said, you will. He said, even when you do all of that, this will be um, paraphrase, 2021 translation. He said, even when you've done all of that, to sit on my right and my left is not mine to give. He says, it shall be for those who it is prepared by my father. In other words, James and James and John, you're going to do very well. James, you're going to get an A star. John, you know, you're going to do greatly. You're going to you drink of the cup, you do everything. He said, but even when you've done all of that, I cannot guarantee that you're going to be at my right hand and at my left. Because it is God who will, it is the Father who is going to decide that. And there are a lot of other people who will also get a star like you. So when you get there, just chill. Let's give the Lord a clap of free. I took time to explain that and then use a Kenneth Hagin illustration as given by the Holy Spirit. So, you know, in our thinking, we have this funny 
mentality. Let Jesus be your ruler. When I say ruler now, I mean measure. Um, your ambition in life should become like Jesus. Let that be your goal. So you're not worried about what Mr. X is doing or what Mr. Y is doing. That's not your business. You think soberly and go for Jesus. Give him another clap offering. Now let's look at verses, uh, just a few verses before I close. He said, for, the word for is like because. He said, the reason why you need to think of yourself soberly and no more highly than you ought is because what I've been saying, you know, you can now appreciate what I'm, you know, when I read all of these scriptures, you can see it's contextual uh, relevance. It says, for, as we have many members, as a many so there are many good brethren. You are not the only one, no. <laughs> for we have many members, for as we have many members, I didn't hear you, in one body, and all the members have not the same office. You know, you know we, 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 we will not have the same office and responses at the same time. That's why there's going to be the one that's like the nose, the one that's like the eyes, the one that is like the hand, the one that is like the legs. You know, well, our positions will be relative. But as you grow, your relative position can change. Because see, where you're going to is to become like Jesus. Hallelujah. There's a beautiful thought the Holy Ghost gave me some time ago, not today, you know, some time ago. He said, do you notice that the government is on the shoulders? The Bible says the government shall be upon his shoulders. Now, if you're thinking of the body of Christ as a spiritual organism, the thing that is closest to the head is the shoulders. And once you move above the shoulders, you get to the head. Which, which is symbolic, you know, of, of, of growth. You get to the place where, you know, when you get to a place where you're conformed to the image of Jesus, it is people like that that God puts the responsibility of the government of the church upon. It's the truth. The government shall be on his shoulders. You know, if you look at the body, you begin to see very, very significant things. You see, the legs are for walking. You know, this area of the waist is the reproductive area. You know, so as you move up, you begin to move. The heart is very important. If anything happens to the heart, you know. So, as we grow spiritually, God begins to put us in more positions of responsibility. The heart will be like the intercessors. Nothing must go wrong with the heart. It must continue to beat. And so on and so forth. God will give you understanding. Let me leave it like that. So we being many, I didn't hear you. So we being many are one body in Christ and everyone members one of another. I just got another text from heaven. You know, the Holy Spirit just, uh, just dropped this to me. He said, of all the guys in the church at that time, the person that got the revelation of the body of Christ was Paul. The others picked it later, but Paul it was very comprehensive. That's what he's talking about. You see it more comprehensively in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul had an, and then you see it again in Ephesians, you know, that the body was an organism of diff, made of different parts and members. So he saw the folly. By this revelation, he saw the folly of comparing amongst yourselves. You know, he wrote in one of his letters, you know what he said? He said, some say I am of Paul. Some say I'm of Cephas. Say some say I'm of Barnabas. Some say, he said, silly people. This is Olubi translation. He said, see, he said, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Or were you baptized in the name of Barnabas or Cephas? No, no, no. It's childish spiritual thinking that makes you think like that. No, all of us are members of the body. And as we grow spiritually, our relative positions will change. That's okay, you know. And ultimately, if you do your growth properly, you get to your ultimate. And that will not take away from the other person's own. I don't know if I'm talking to anybody. Having then, verse 6, gifts 
differing, differing rather, according to the grace that's given unto us, whether prophecy, I didn't hear you, let us prophesy, according to the proportion of faith. Yeah, we're not at the same level. Different people are different levels. Some can prophesy on a much higher level of faith. Others can prophesy at a lower level of faith. It doesn't matter. We're all growing. Are you listening to me? Bless and honor the other person. You know, help them to develop. Mommy sent something out beautifully today. You know, I'm going to... I, I don't know if I've asked the pastor to send it. You know, I will do that. You know, to send out about leadership. Somebody wrote a you know, nice... You know, and it was, it was very, very good. You know, a leader, you know, and I use Jesus to, uh, to, to uh, uh, exemplify it. You know what Jesus said? He said, the works I do, you will do and greater. A true leader wants people to grow, to get to where he is, and even surpass it. Why not? You know, there's no, uh, there's no competition here. <laughs> It's, 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 it, 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 we're supposed to be helping one another. So, when, if somebody's prophesying at a lower level, encourage them. And teach them how they can do it better. Praise the Lord. Don't despise them. And don't, don't say, oh, you know, I'm better than you. No, no, no. All that language is carnality. Having then, gifts differing, according to the grace that's given, where prophesy letters, according to the proportion of faith. Verse 7. Or ministry... Let us wait on our ministering. Ministry here just means service. You know, because of the Nigerian mentality, when you say the man is a minister, <laughs> and they, they, you know, he's not a minister, he's the federal minister. Ah, who oh, are they here? We often think of minister in terms of, of, of privilege and position. That sadly, in the Nigerian context and in many other places too, you know, through corruption, use people to enrich themselves. The, 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 the Christian Bible uh, understanding of minister is the exact opposite. Jesus said that he that is great among you, he will let him be your minister. He's a servant. He's, he gives life for others. He says, death walketh in us, but life in you. And as a minister, he gives up his legitimate pleasures. And time where he could be doing the things other people do, you know, he gives that all that up to spend more time in the Word, to spend more time in prayer, so he can minister to people. You know, that's, that's, that's a true minister. And then he wants others too to learn from his example, so they too can become the same. You know, so that's why our ministers wait on our ministry, or he that teacheth on teaching. You know, he didn't give a comprehensive list here. He, he just gave like a kind of, a, uh, like a buffet. You know, you know, in a buffet, you see rice, you see... He, just should, he didn't talk... He talked more comprehensively about this in Ephesians... Sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, as well as Ephesians chapter 4. You know, we talked about the gifts in more detail. But here, he just, he, just, he, just, he just sprinkled a few gifts around, you know. But he, just, he was using to explain a point that don't think of yourself more highly. There are different members of the body of Christ in different positions. You know, you do your bit, let others do their bit, and edify and help one another. Verse 8, and we'll close with that verse. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation and he that giveth let him do it with simplicity. I love that. You know, there's a place in the body of Christ for giving. You know, not because I, have the, I have the ministry of giving. There's no such thing. Some, don't be silly. <laughs> you know, everybody should give. <laughs> there's no such thing as, you know, uh, he's just saying different functions that people can get involved in. If you give, do it. And all of us are supposed to give. As we grow spiritually and financially, we're supposed to increase in what we give. But what I love here is he said, do it with simplicity. Don't do it with noise. Our people love noise, especially in Nigeria. But it's all over the world, really. It's human ego. It's part of that lust of the flesh, which is called the pride of life. You do something you want everybody to know. So you blow your trumpet. And you know what Jesus said? He said, don't be like the hypocrites. He said, when they give, he said, when you give alms, he said, do it in secret. He said, don't be like the hypocrites who blow a trumpet and want everybody to know what they've done. He said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That's a very serious matter. He said, you know, even in your own body, just, he said, do it quietly. Do it with simplicity. Don't, you know, because you're not doing it 
unto man, you're doing it unto God. So if people know, sometimes you can't help if people will know. But you're not doing it so that people will know. You're doing it to be a blessing to that person and to give glory to God. And that's how you should do it. You know, and we need to learn all of these things. He said, let him do it with what simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. I preached a message on this many years ago. You know, ruling with diligence. Diligence means consistent, you know, um, um, consistent effort. You know, you're applying regular, consistent, well-directed effort. Rule there means rule, you know, like the Bible says, you know, uh, in, in uh, Psalm 110. It says, the rod of strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. It means, you know, to govern by the power of the Holy Spirit. Through prayer and intercession, apostolic and prophetic decrees, you know, we pray in tongues and we make decrees as led by the Spirit. Then we rule. He said, when you do, he said, do it with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Everybody's supposed to do that. We're supposed to be showing mercy to the poor, helping people. You know, it, in, 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 it includes giving. And then it also goes even beyond giving money, you know, or some material thing. Just caring for people. You know, just showing mercy and helping people. In conclusion, what Paul is telling us is this. Let's maintain an attitude. I'm going to talk about this in my main message later. I have a very important present true prophetic message for us today because we're at a particular juncture spiritually I'll deal with that later on but humility see everything Paul has said here comes from humility when you think more highly was that pride when you think soberly was that humility see maintain no matter how great you become and you will become great. I didn't hear you. You know why? If you grow spiritually, you'll be great. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is like a small seed. So when you sow it, it's smallest of all the seeds in the ground, which is your mind, your will, your emotions, and all of that. He said, but when it groweth, it becometh greater. So there is no doubt you're going to become great as you grow spiritually. But as you grow great, don't get proud. Stay humble. It's, the, it's easy to say. It's not easy to do. You know, somebody said, I think it was Denzel Washington, one of the actors in America, and he's a Christian, you know. He said that success is more difficult to manage than failure. You know why? Success always causes people to become lifted up. To think of themselves more highly. You know, you, you make a few billions... You know, and then they say you are the richest man in Africa. Then from there you become the richest man in the world. And then when they now declare you the richest man in the world, you now think it is your reserve to start lecturing everybody else. <laughs> I'm not mentioning any names. <laughs> and you think it is in your power now to speak disparagingly about your seniors who are richer before you. <laughs> Stay sober, boy. You weren't there just a few years ago. God's put you there now. And it may not last. <laughs> you don't know what's coming in the future. Let's stand to your feet. Let's learn this lesson. Stay humble. Stay humble. The greater you become, the higher you go in God, the more humble you have to be. And you have to do it. I'm going to say this in my main message. It's one of the main points I'm going to say this afternoon. You know, you've got to do it deliberately. Humility is not automatic. That's why of all the prayers I have taught you, when I say I, now I yet not I, but the grace of God which is with me, the one of the most important ones, there are two of them. I'm going to talk about them in my main message. But the Holy Spirit is just prompting me to just say about them now is the, is, the, is the prayer for humility. Whatever else you miss every day, don't miss that prayer. I choose to fear God. It's a choice. It's not automatic. 
So I humble myself and I submit to the will of God even when I don't feel like it, especially in prayer. Knowing the certainty of his judgment if I disobey and the security of his mercy when I obey. So I have more. You should get, you should be more humble today than you were yesterday. And you should be more humble tomorrow than you are today. If you don't pray that prayer, your heart will become lifted up. Especially as you begin to progress and you, begin, you become greater. It's just, it's a part of the sin, satanic nature that is inside the soul. It becomes, you say, when Uzziah, when he became strong, he said his heart was lifted up. That's a negative example. But let's now use for a positive example. His name is Joseph. Give him a clap offering, everybody. He's in heaven. Ah, Joseph, I can never... He's one of my greatest uh, examples in the Bible. You know? I love David too. But Joseph is in a different class. Joseph stayed humble when he became the most powerful man on earth. Who prospered Egypt? It was, it was not Pharaoh. It was Joseph. Jo- Pharaoh was just like the figurehead king. The person that was really in charge was Joseph. So much so that Pharaoh said that in all of Egypt, there will be not only in the throne will I be greater than you. And then he told them, whenever his chariot is coming, he said, bow the knee, bow the knee. <laughs> ah! Joseph. Yet he didn't get to his head. Joseph was so humble. He, 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 I know it didn't happen automatically. He was using these principles. He kept saying it. It's his mouth. And then now we have the Holy Ghost who prayed. Stay humble. It's easier said than done. Success, money, fame, human recognition is easy to get to her. Ah, the man of God of the hour. <laughs> And, you know, we like saying such things. And we love it too. We love those akule. Ah! The man of God of the hour. There is none like him in all the earth. I say this jokingly to my pastors. and I, You know, I, get that nonsense out of your head. Oh. Tell yourself sober. I have to stay sober. I receive more of the humility of the daily the second one is fruit those two prayers whatever else you miss every day those two don't miss them because they are short prayers you know even if you are busy and everything pray that prayer every day with your heart god keep me humble i want more humility so that as i rise and you are going to rise everyone say i'm going to rise there is no doubt about it. If you are with God, you are going to rise. But the more I rise, the more humble I become. Let's talk to God. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 12. And uh, in our last lessons, we actually had two. I covered verses 3 through 8. And uh, verse 3, I think we did over a two-week period. But uh, I want to bring out this fact that Paul mentioned here. He said that we should not think of ourselves more highly, but we should think soberly according as God dealt to every man the measure of faith. And I have this uh, thing here in my notes, uh, which I passed over from the last lesson. And it says, don't think of yourself more highly than you are. This, think soberly, recognize. A lot of Christians don't do that. God gives all of us at the beginning, the same measure of faith. And your position in the body of Christ is relative and dynamic. And I put a footnote there. Remember James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they went up to the Lord Jesus, they used their mother, <laughs> and asked whether they could be on the right or to the left, or right on hand or the left hand of, 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 of God's throne. Hey, what, what presumptuousness. Now, of course, you, they were great disciples, but they're not the only ones. That's what happens when you think of yourself more highly. You start thinking that, you know, you're some uh, special super saint, 
and there's none like you in all the earth. Like I asked the rhetorical question when I shared that. I said, if James sits on the left and John sits on the right, where in the world are we going to put Enoch? And where are we going to put Joseph? You know, and then where are we going to put Moses? And then where are we going to put Elijah and Elisha and, uh, and some of the other great saints? Think soberly. Thank God for you, but you're not the only one. Amen? And such thinking comes out of a heart of pride. You know, you know that's why more highly, you know, that's what pride does. It makes you think of yourself. That's what happened to Lucifer. You start thinking of yourself more highly. I will be like the most high. It's not wrong in thinking to be high, but do it soberly under God. And then let it be God who puts you in the position... You see, because you, who, what do you know? You know what you know? What you know? <laughs> what God knows far exceeds what you know. So in your own thinking, in your little, in the little universe of your mind, <laughs> you think you're something, you know. But when God looks at the global picture from his perspective, yeah, you're something, but... There are a lot of other people who are a little bit more than you. The, you know, I use that simple illustration of Peter, uh, and, of James and John. That's what happens when you start comparing yourself among yourself and you start thinking of yourself more highly than you ought. You start in your imagination and in your thinking. That's what they were doing. You know, oh, I want to be on the right hand, I want to be on the left hand. So what happens to Peter? <laughs> and of course, you know, all the other guys, all the other 12 guys, you know, everybody was full of indignation. It caused a rift b- b- between them. And, and Jesus had to correct them and said, look, you guys, you don't get it. Yes. He said, can you drink of the cup? I'll drink of this. They said, yeah. He said, sure, you can. And pr- you will. You know? He said, but to put you on the right one, it's not mine to give. We can't judge it just based on just your little tiny ministry in Palestine. <laughs> you know, there are lots of other saints that have come before you. And there are a lot of other saints that are coming after you. So that's the kind of judgment. That judgment call can't be made now. It's going to be made at the end of the age. When God now sees what everybody has done. And then that's why I said, it is not for me to give it. He said, it will be given to those whom my father has prepared it. So it's very important. Don't become a universe in your own mind. And most people think like that. You know, they think that what they think is everything. Now, as I said, think soberly. According as God to every man the measure of faith. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 12, the Apostle Paul says that they that compare themselves among themselves are not wise. They that judge themselves among themselves are not wise. And I said this, and this is a great thing God taught me many, many years ago. And by His grace and mercy, I have endeavored and still endeavor to use it as my, uh, uh, to practice that. I always compare myself with Jesus. I don't compare myself with men. I used to, but I stopped it. You know, I'll look at this person, I'll look at this person, oh, look at what God has done in this person's life, look at what he's done in this person's ministry. And once you start doing that, you start feeling funny. You know, that's how envy, pride, and all kinds of silly things come in. But if you keep Jesus as your yardstick, no matter how great you become, it will keep you humble. Because Jesus will always be greater than you. Amen. And then I also said something during that Bible study. I believe I said that, you know, our positions, our eternal positions in God are secure. See, every one of us has a destiny to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Sadly and regrettably, not everyone will. But let's put that aside. Let's for the sake of assumption, let's assume everybody becomes gold. And everybody grows to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now how then is God going to position things? If everybody has everybody, you know, met that divine standard, you know, then there must be a way God is going to handle that. And and, and the Lord gave me this thought. I shared it here and I shared it years ago. You know, he said, look at the heavens. You know, do you know how many billions of of galaxies 
and 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 and, and uh, st- billions of stars. This our sun here is called the yellow star. Our sun, the sun in our solar system here, is for those of us who have done a little bit of physics and uh, you know um, astronomy, you know, uh, and we call it cosmology. You know, the study of the cosmos. You know, <laughs> with oh, we just discovered some of these things. Only barely a hundred years ago, there was a scientist called Arthur Eddington. He was one of the people that did an experiment to prove that what Albert Einstein said that light bends in strong gra- gravitational fields, you know, that it was actually true. But anyway, he was the one that discovered that the planets are moving away, you know, fa- you know, very fast, you know, at speed of light from, you know, and, and the universe is expanding. Anyway, to cut a long story short, they now discovered, you know, we used to think we were really big. <laughs> and this is our little ballpark here. And I'm talking about our solar system. You know, our sun, and then, you know, we have Mars and Jupiter and, and all of this sort of thing. We're just a very tiny, <laughs> you know, very tiny part of the Milky Way universe, uh, galaxy. Then there are billions of galaxies like the Milky Way, you know, that, you know, fill the entire cosmos. And all that is first heavens. This is physical. Because that's why scientists have, you know, they've they got a little bit more respect for God now. They don't call it God, but, you know, you know what they call it? The observable universe. Before they used to say the universe. But now, we've learned now, we're still learning that uh, this is just the one we can see. We now know that there's dark ma- ma- matter and there's dark energy. We can see it, but we can see its effect. You know, that's causing the planets to move at, you know, uh, 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 the speed of light in every direction. You know, uh, uh, you know, ordinarily, you know, gravity, if you throw a ball, it will come down. So, the gravitational force ought to be bringing things together. But it's not. Things are flying apart. So there is a force that is stronger than gravity. That's pushing the thing out. <laughs> they call it dark energy. Then they find that this, the, 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 the galaxies and the planets, they're spiraling, you know, they're spiraling around each other at a speed that is faster than the mass that is inside. So, yeah, that's why we call that one dark matter. So, <laughs> there's... There's a substance we can't see that's causing things to go faster and faster and faster. Then there's substance, there's a force we can't see that's causing things to move out. His name is God. Give him a clap offering. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need, you know, unless you're dishonest, you know. Uh, when, I, when I saw all of that, you know, the, and the, all, all this war we're talking about what, what was observed about, you know, maybe a hundred years ago. I, Eddington did his experiments, you know, in the 1920s. So this is about 100 years. But we didn't understand. Understand has just come in the last 20, 30 years, you know, because of all the telescopes we sent out. And we're not getting information we didn't have before. Anyway, the point is this. The Bible says that faith is the evidence of things not seen. You know, for the invisible things of him are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, you know, so that the things which are made are made out of things which we do not see. We now have the evidence. We still can't see it. But we know that there's something in there that's causing all of these things. And it's God who is behind that. Praise the Lord. You know, uh, the more you study science and all of that, if you're honest, the more you will come to the conclusion that there is a, there's an intelligent creator who you cannot see or observe through the physical world, you know, that is controlling all of these things. It was uh, Erwin Schrodinger. Schrodinger is a German scientist who got the Nobel Prize. You know, he did all the, uh, well, not all, but he did a significant amount of work in quantum mechanics. And there's a famous equation called the Schrodinger equation, which was, he didn't even, he didn't even derive it. He postulated it. A postulate is something you say that you think makes sense. There's no, and then when they do the experiments, they now find it's actually so. So that's why we call it, you know. And this is what Erwin Schrodinger said. He said, when you 
take the first gulp, it's like drinking a glass of water. So when you first take the first gulp of the physical sciences, you know, it makes you want to become an atheist. Or someone says that there is no God as the people in the evolution. He said, but God is waiting for you at the bottom of the tumbler. Give the Lord a clap offering. Hey, this is a, this is a, as far as I know, I don't know if he was born again. But that's just, that's just honest observation. God is waiting for you. You're going to see things you can't explain. And the only explanation is an intelligent creator. Give Elohim another clap offering. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, how do we get on that? God told me, he said, he said, if I gave every human being that, ever, that is ever born, if you take all the population of ma- mankind from, let's just start from Adam and Eve, we can go back, but let's, let's leave that one because that's the devil and his angels and all of that. You know, if you take it from Adam and Eve to date, at today we are about 7 billion you know, on the earth, you know. So if you backtrack and you just do a statistical, this, this is what you call, in science, we call it a guesstimate. So you can't hold me to this. But I would, you know, from knowledge of um, population growth and all of that, you can do a, you know, uh, a slight uh, estimate. Uh, a guesstimate will be the, everybody who's been created from Adam till now and being extremely generous, let's call it 20 billion. I know it's not. I know it's not because in those days they didn't have science and all of that. Today, infant mortality has gone down. People live longer because of medical science. In the days of Abraham and all that, you know, people people were born and then they died, you know, of all kinds of diseases and everything. They're not lost to. Another message for another day. But the point is this. If you you make it 20 billion and God said, ah, 20 billion, you're so many. <laughs> so he says, all right. Everybody who becomes conformed to the image of Jesus, his reward is that I'm going to reward each of you with your own galaxy. There will only be 20 billion galaxies. It doesn't even begin to scratch the surface. Why? So you don't have to compete with anybody else. Christianity is a race to become like Jesus. It's not a race against your brother or your sister. So, you, we, we, we should never have a sense of competition. Their reward can never take away from your own. God has too much. Hallelujah. And each of those galaxies, the people who have a throne. <laughs> so, your throne cannot be, you know, uh, uh, jeopardized by the throne of another person. In fact, when you help other people, you are helping yourself. So they should never, I put it here in my notes, they should never be competition amongst Christians. There should only be complementation. So we complement one another. We don't compete with one another. Because if I do what I'm supposed to do, the only problem I can have is if I don't do what I'm supposed to do. When I don't do what I'm supposed to do, God can now take, he said, take that which he has and then give it to another. Now, that's not because God didn't want to give it to him. It's because he didn't grow spiritually enough to have the wisdom and the capacity to handle it. And God's not a careless God. He's not going to give a, can you imagine giving a whole universal solar system to some? Silence. (laughs) Praise the Lord. You know, so you don't want to do that. So, turn to your neighbor and say, grow. And help others to grow. And you'll be okay. Then we also look at the uh, vocational gifts. Well, here in verses 6 through 8, Paul said, look, we're all members of the same body. I spoke about that. You know, your position in the body is relative and it's dynamic. What does that mean? God gave me this revelation in 1981. You know, well, that's why everybody was trying to find out, are you a pastor, are you a teacher, are you a prophet? Everybody was an apostle, praise the Lord. I remember Paul Keller Hagen, I said that in a respectful kind of way, you know. You know, Brother Hagen was saying this, you know, because I was in Tulsa for about uh, two months in 1981. You know, I, I went to go for camp meeting, God didn't allow the money to come. So a few months later, the money came in September. So I went and I spent two months because I had some friends there and they had a son who was my by my age and he was in the 
in Rayma Bible Training Center. So I was staying, you know, they got a flat, they had a flat for him and one other Italian guy and myself, you know, so we were staying out in town and we would take his car and go to school every day, you know, to Rayma Bible Training Center. That was one of the greatest blessings God gave me. It gave me an insight into the faith message. I saw the excesses. I was inside like the inner circle. I was hearing what was going on. So, you know, my eyes opened. Unlike some of our guys from Nigeria who only girls go for camp meeting, they'll go for one week and come back. And they come back starry-eyed without knowing what was really going on. Anyway, so it was during that experience I would go every afternoon, I will go to Rima, and I was allowed, I wasn't a re- registered student, but you know, Kenneth Hagin was such a nice guy, he didn't stop anybody from coming, you know, so I would just sit down and I'll listen, and I heard, I remember Brother Hagin, you know, uh, saying that when he started ba- Rima Bible Training Center, he said, whenever they were writing their application form, they said, what do you think God has called you to be? <laughs> he said, over 90 something percent of all the people, of the all apostles. He said, and then when they now come to the school, and by the time you instruct them for a few months, you find that no, 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 not yet anyway. You know, you're either, you know, a pastor or a teacher. You know, it's because people always think of themselves, you know, because the Bible says first apostles. So everybody wants to be an apostle. It's all this foolishness. You know, and, 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 and spiritual myopia, spiritual short-sightedness that make people think like that. So to straighten me out, the Lord gave me this understanding. He said, you see, your position in the, in the body is relative and is dynamic. What does that mean? When you get, people are getting born again every day and people are dying and going to heaven every day. So, talking about the body of Christ on the earth. So, your position today will not be your position in two years time and so god puts you in in the body he plants you i am the vine you are the branches he plants you inside the body in a place where he has ordained for you to start now as you begin to grow and develop spiritually that will change and you see paul is the pattern disciple you see paul starting out get born again and he preaches which is evangelistic work in uh, in damascus then you know he runs and goes to arabia and then he's there for some years get revelation then he comes back into the church at antioch he first of all starts just as a pastor and a teacher then he grows and then he becomes a prophet you know begins to get prophetic revelation then later on he says separate on me barnabas and saul you know into apostolic work all this thing didn't take you read it in five minutes it didn't take five minutes it took years now that's what people don't understand. So don't get all, you know, disturbed about who I am and what I am. And you don't worry about that. You, 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 you concentrate on growing to the image of Jesus. As you grow, different anointings will come to enable you to operate in different functions that God puts you in as the body of Christ evolves. The word evolve just means change. It's not evolution. You know, as, as the church is evolving all the time, you know, and when you understand that, you say, oh, okay, this is where God wants me to be now. You know, I remember when we first started out, everyone said, you're not a pastor, you're a teacher. I said, who told you? <laughs> you know, God told us, you know, to start a church. In fact, this is how the Lord said to me. He said, you need a place, a forum, where you can teach the word of God on a consistent and systematic basis so that people can grow. And what happened to me, uh, let me just share my experience, you know, very briefly, was, you know, uh, this was 1981. At 80, I came back. I worked with Amigo for about a year. Then God said to me, look, go get a job and be in a practical, real-life situation so you know how to use your faith in real life. So when you're talking to people, you won't be talking theory. You know, you're not in the midst of uh, people just come and give to you, which there's nothing wrong in that. But, you know, you want to learn how to go to work like everybody else, get up early in the morning like everybody else, you know, and then be disciplined. So you, you're under the same pressures that they are under. Then you can learn. And that's how I learned, by the grace and the mercy of God, so many things. Anyway, so, um, and I, you know, so people used to invite me to preach. You know, I'll go and preach in IVCU in uh, University of Ibadan. Then they'll invite me to Polytechnic. And my friend, Wale Adikoyo, blessed memory, you know, he was president of the 
Christian Union in, in Polytechnic. So he would invite me to come. They would invite me in Ilori. You know, they would invite me in Ife. So that's how people got, got to know me, you know. I'm talking about 1981, 82. You know, I'd, I'd go and preach. Then I discovered something. You know, I could use IVCU. I would go, you know, and teach revelation knowledge by the grace of God. You know, what did I know in those days? What my fathers taught me. E.W. Kenyon, Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland basically you know i hadn't even gone much into the prophetic at that time you know and of course uh, sg elton pa elton you know and i would just go and, and and teach what i had learned from the other people and people would be blessed and they'll come to me and say oh pastor Luby. well i wasn't pastor then brother luby you know this and that you know and all of that then it's come that you know three weeks later somebody else comes and says the exact opposite of everything i said this is what motivated me to start scripture pasture. That's why the name is scripture pasture. It's a pasture where scripture is the food. <laughs> you know, that's how the name came. So, you know, I, I come on. I, I discovered the, the, this, you know, by interacting with some of the brethren, I discovered the saints were confused. Why? Because they're being fed, you know, a, a diet that is. <laughs> You know, incomplete. Not only is it incomplete, it's poisonous. Some of us will teach proper revelation. Another person will come next week and talk, you know, uh, you know legalism. And the, so the saints become confused. So I now, you know, my friend and I line ready to go. Said, Look, let's start a church. You see, I, it wasn't because I wanted a church. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to become a big man and <laughs> that don't do that. You know, a place where... The people will come. I will be teaching them the same. That's how I started the Bible study. Every day, you know, I'll teach Romans. I'll teach Ephesians. I'll teach Hebrews. And that's how we started. To the glory of God. You know. And, and we've seen the results over the years. You know, you, got, you have a bond says who know where they're going. Whose head is correct. <laughs> are you listening to me? Not people who don't know where they're going. Who don't know who they are. Who just, you know, like the children of Israel going around the same circle. You know for years so that's uh, uh what 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 motivated us to start uh the, the church of course that's what a church is <laughs> for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ it's a place where people are fed the word of god so that they can grow they keep it simple okay so th that's we, we 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 by the grace of the mercy of god we we started the, the 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 church in that way, you know, and uh, and then so the question was, oh, Luby, you're, you're a teacher, you're not a pastor, you know. I said, come on, I had nothing to do with you know, you you can't label me, you know, and of course, so by the grace of God, mercy of God, over these years, you know, I everybody knew me first as a teacher because I was an itinerant teacher teaching in you know these university fellowships, you know. But when we started scripture pastor, then the pastoral came in. It kicked in and then by the grace of God, I think he has had mercy on me. <laughs> He's helped me, you know. You know, and then after some years, as I get a prophetic anointing, as I teaching, you know, uh, teaching prophetically like Jesus does, you know. So what I'm saying is that don't put yourself in a box. You grow. As you grow, the different unctions and anointings will come, you know. That's why it is relative and it is dynamic. Uh, uh, and then, you know, we, then we had this group of, uh, of gifts, you know. In, he said, having gifts, therefore, differing according to the grace has given us prophecy, uh, ministry, teaching, you know, exhorting. Is exhorting? Is exhortation a gift? Yes, it is. Giving with simplicity, showing mercy. So, and I explained that those verses speak is like a, a um, it's a mixture in actual fact uh, our book has just come out the gifts and the calling of god it's available now on amazon and i want to rec i recommend it by the grace and the mercy of god it will help you and bring a lot of clarity uh, to some of these things you know and uh, i explained there you know that there are three categories of gifts they're what we call vocational gifts which are just natural talents, like everybody, like Bezalel, that the Holy Spirit anoints so that you can use it to serve God. 
So you can be a banker. You can be a, 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 a tailor. You can be a, a, a cook. You know, you can be an engineer. You can be an architect. Whatever. God will now take that natural ability, if you give it to him in prayer, he will anoint it, and then you can design this church. For example, people like uh, Brother Adishola, Brother Okori, Engineer Aileka, and many others, Deji Famalusi, they've done a lot of work in this church, using their talents, but they're anointed to do it, because they submit it to God, and then pray, and then the Holy Spirit anoints it. Everybody has that, because everybody has something they can do. That's why the, the Paul just gives the general something here says you know he that give it let him do it so give what not only just money you give your time you give your talent you know into the house of god then there are what we call ministry gifts these are really offices you know which are the fivefold ministries apostle evangelist apostle let, let's do it properly it's apostles prophets teachers pastors and evangelists that's the correct order you see it in first corinthians chapter 12 i'm not going to go there right now you know and you also see another list in ephesians chapter 4 but the important thing is this those offices you know are uh, positions that god puts people into to feed the church so that the church can grow into the fullness of christ and then the lord gave me this beautiful illustration it's in our book you know uh, uh, of understanding it. It's like a uh, factory production line. You know, I've never... Had, the day the Lord gave me, I said, it's so simple, and it's the truth. You know, in a, in, 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 a, in a factory, maybe they're making cars. At one end of the factory, they bring in all the raw material. Things like, also, you know, metal and all kinds of things, you know. Then you have robots. Now they have robots on an assembly line. And they begin to, you know, so one person is making the tire. Another person is making the engine. Another person is making the ignition and all of that. Then as you go, you know, down the assembly line, they now begin to put it together. And at the end of the assembly line, a car comes out. What is the church? It is a production factory that takes human beings from sinner to the fullness of Christ. And what you have... You know, in the assembly line are these ministries. So at the tail end of the assembly line, you've got the evangelist. That's what he does. Now, a lot of people can also do the work of the evangelist. Who, what He brings in the raw material, which is the same the sinner. And gets him born again and puts him in the church. Then he shifts him to the pastor. The pastor tells him, the evangelist teaches the what of the gospel. The pastor tells him why. Why you need to still come into church. You know, you can't just come and, and, and go back. You know, so he exhorts him. That's why you have exhortation there. That's part of the pastoral ministry. But, you know, that's not all he does. You know, and begins to feed him the word of God. Show him example. Pray for him. Lay his life down for him. As a good shepherd in intercession. And, and the person begins to grow. But you can't stop there. He now shifts him to the teacher. The teacher now begins to give him instruction on the foundational truths of the word of God. You know, healing, prosperity, deliverance, so that he can overcome the, the satanic uh, attacks that's going to come against him as a saint, you know, and so he can begin to enjoy his benefits in Christ Jesus. I heard somebody say this, and I need to correct it. Um, I do not say this in a wrong spirit. I say it in the right spirit. I heard somebody say, and the person was trying to be holy. He said, Jesus didn't die to make us rich. He only died to make us holy. It's a half truth. Yes, Jesus died to make us holy. But that's not the only thing he paid for. He also died to make us rich. The scripture says so. That he through his, you know, he who was rich was made poor. That you, you, that you through, through his poverty uh, might become rich. You know, I don't know if it's this, making this noise. Okay, excuse me. I think it's on silent. Right. So, you know, yes. You know, so, so, so that's what the teacher comes in. Teaches you the principles of prosperity. Teaches you the principle of healing. You know, of deliverance. So you can live a victorious Christian life. But that is not the end of your Christianity. Just to be healed and delivered. So he needs to move you to the prophet. So the prophet now begins to tell you who you are. And what your purpose is. And, and, and what you ought to do 
to fulfill that purpose. And it makes you very uncomfortable because after the teacher has finished with you and is giving you healing, prosperity, you want to settle. <laughs> How do I know? I've been through all the five over these 40 years. So I know. I'm talking about the, the, the anointings, the teaching anointings. You know, this, this you know, I, 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 by the grace of God, I can do the work of an evangelist. I do it all the time. You know, if I, in a place I can do an altar call, get people saved. You know, then, you know, the, the, the pastor, you know, encourage people to continue the faith. Then the teacher, you need to teach them about, you know, all these, their rights. Then, you know, that transition from teacher to prophet is where we have problem. People don't like prophets. Because prophet don't make you uncomfortable. Hey, the teacher, you, ah, praise God. <laughs> eh? God wants me healed. He wants me delivered. He wants me, ah, what else is left? Eh? God bless. God, I lost all room. You know, but I ain't going to say, you know, God wants you to move on, you know, into the perfection of fullness of Christ, and people don't believe it. And then the apostle gets established in what the prophet reveals. And then by, by, you, by the time the apostle finishes with you, he pushes you out of the production line and you should have, come out, you know, with the spirit without measure or the borrowed anointing at least. That's the fivefold ministry. That's what, and that's what they're for. They are functional, they are functional uh, uh, ministries. The word minister just means to serve. They are functional offices. They have a function. There's a, it's forget the titles. Forget the big, becoming a big man. <laughs> it's supposed to be anointings that are used to, you know, perform functions, you know, in the manner in which I've described. And then, for the vocational as well as the ministry gifts, you have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which embellish or they uh, assist those ministries. So somebody who is a vocation, for example, a doctor, you know, who's a good doctor and he's using his, his, his knowledge of medicine to serve in the church. You know, maybe he's in an operation, uh, somebody, you know, who has a sickness and disease. Then God gives him a word of knowledge. Don't cut here, cut here. It's still the same knowledge of anatomy that he has, but that knowledge will make the difference between him and another person who will cut in the wrong place and kill the patient. Yes. That's where that, that, how did he know that? Supernaturally. The Holy Spirit can give him a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. So you find that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the nine gifts, the revelation gifts, the power gifts, the um, spoken or the utterance or the vocal gifts, you know, are given by God to embellish the word embellish just to, you know, make finer, praise the Lord. Make, make them look better, make them function better, these basic vocational and ministry gifts. So at the bottom of the sum, you've got the vocational and ministry gifts, then you now have sprinklings of the gifts of the Holy Spirit to help them f- fulfill their function. It's really as simple as that. All the other stuff is just, <laughs> praise the Lord. And so we went through all of that, you know, and, um, and so... Um, 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 uh, and God wants to, but Paul, you know, because you have to read other parts of the Bible, you have to read Ephesians, you have to read First Corinthians to get this complete picture. This summary he gives here in Romans chapter twelve is just a summary of all, everything I've said in a very compact form: exhortation, giving, teaching, prophesying. So you got a little bit of gifts of the Spirit there, you got a little bit of uh, ministry gifts there, you got a little bit of vocational gifts there, all mixed together. You know, but uh, by the grace and the mercy of God, I've helped you to uh, see what he's talking about. Now, let, I'll start briefly, and uh, we'll take this in my next lesson. So, after he's told them all of that, he now begins to give them instructions of Christian conduct. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to just look at the first three verses from verse 9 through 12. And then my next lesson will go beyond that. And I, I, I want to, by the grace and the mercy of God, give you the principle. So what I discovered about God's Word over these years is that, and that's what I'm going to minister in my main message later on this morning or afternoon, is that once you understand the fundamental underlying principles, you won't stray. 
The problem with most people is they don't understand the basic principles of God. And so they, 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 they run away with a tangents, you know. And, and here, Paul is not telling them, after saying all of this, you know, uh, remember where we're coming from. We're coming from Romans chapter 1. Sinners and all of that. Christ died for us, you know. Then Roman, you know. Then we have to walk by faith, not by the um, um, uh, the ceremonial laws of Moses. You know, he 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 demolishes all of that. Then he talks about the problem in Proverbs chapter five, six, seven. The flesh lost against spirit, the spirit against the flesh. Then he now gives them the solution in verse 8 of the law of the spirit of life. Christ Jesus sets us free from the law of sin and death, which makes you more than a conqueror. That, you know, nothing can separate you from the love of God, you know, except yourself. You know, uh, if you don't do those things, if you don't practice those things. You know, and then he goes to Romans 9 and 10 and 11, talks about Israel. It's like a parenthesis. Now he now comes to Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, I'm begging you. In the light of everything I've been saying since chapter 1, present your body a living sacrifice, make, you know, holy and acceptable unto God. It talks about the transformation of the physical body and, and the mind so that let your mind be renewed so you can progressively prove the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. You know, show that the will of God, the ultimate will of God is good. It's acceptable and it's perfect. But there are stages in getting into it. You know, you get born again, that's good. You get baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's acceptable. Then you go on to perfection, that's perfect. You're not supposed to, you're not supposed to stay in one position in the things of Jesus. You know? So, it's after he has said all of that, he now, you know, you know, saying, look, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Think soberly and all the things we've spoken about. It is in that light... Now we go to Romans chapter 12, verse 9. It says, let love be without dissimulation. The King James says, the other translation says, without hypocrisy. And I tell you, a lot of love in the church is with hypocrisy. People don't really love. They feign love because of what they can get. Hello. You know, it won't be nice to somebody, but you got an angle. You're looking for something. So, you, <laughs> the Yoruba. <laughs> but there are seven abominations in his heart. Oh, yeah. And it, 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 it is a, it's a part, it's, it's a consequence of the nature of sin. And, and a lot of our goodness and kindness, sometimes, not all, you know, is hypocritical. We're doing it so we can get something, you know, or trying to make people think we are nicer than what we are. The same person who will be laughed with you and say, Oh, praise God. Ah, thank you, bro. Ah, we love you so much. Five minutes later, I say, I remember that alone. <laughs> you know, ah, you know, in our language, that means, don't mind him. Oh. He thinks he's the only one that God wants to bless. And that comes out of envy. But that, the same person was smiling with that person five minutes earlier. It's love with hypocrisy. And it's very common. It's not only, it's not only amongst the Yorubas. <laughs> Even though we specialize in it. <laughs> Hello somebody. Everybody does it. Every tribe, tongue and kindred. It's, a, it's not a Yoruba trait. It's a satanic trait. It's, a, it's the sin nature of fallen man. It comes out like that. The Bible will laugh with you, smile with you. And the same people, you know, it's all hypocrisy. They're trying to make you think that they are nice people. But really, they're not really nice. They're looking for a way to pull you down because they see you doing something that's better than them. Like the Bible says... Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous. <laughs> Give Solomon a clap for free. It's the only God that gave him that scripture. I've, the other day I was reading my, you know, my normal proverb Bible. I said, ah, ah. Wrath is, is cruel. Anger is outrageous. But who can stand before envy? And you know sometimes envy is not angry. And it is not 
is he, he, controlled. He's planning what he wants to plan. He will. He won't. He won't show any. In fact, he'll be laughing with you. Ekbenesa. Ah, Olo ni Jari Remo. But inside his eyes, I say, Olo. Are you listening to me? Envy is a terrible thing, and it is very, it is very common. So Paul says, don't have this superficial love. Don't let it be with uh, dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil and cleave that to that which is good. You know, uh, I'm going to summarize in a minute. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. This is just general Christian exhortation. Not lazy in business. Fervent in spirit. I was talking about vocational gifts the other, uh, you know, a few minutes ago. You know, if you're, if you're doing something for God, God does not like laziness. Say, be f- not slothful business. What? Both spiritual and secular. If you're in the church, I gave the example the other day, you know, Brother Adishola, Brother Corey, and others, you know, engineers, uh, Fam Lucy, and others. You know, hey, they're working inside the church. You understand? You do it with diligence. Diligence. Don't be lazy. Whether it's in your office or whether it's inside the church or whether it's in groaning and prayer, you find a lazy person who is lazy in prayer will be lazy everywhere. It's all discipline. And a lack of it is one of the big problems in the church. Fervent in spirit. You know, you know, the word fervent means hot and boiling. It means you're enthusiastic about what you're doing. Your, your, your heart is in it. You're not just doing it absent-mindedly. You're not just doing it for show. You believe in what you're doing. You, you have an earnest you know, uh, uh, desire. You know, love for what? A passion is the word I'm looking for. Passionate. Some, some people are not passionate about anything. And all that has to change. I'm going to show you how to do it in a minute and then we'll take it next week. Then, 12, he gives you what I can call the key to doing all of these things that he's spoken about from verse 9. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continue instant in prayer. Now, let me try and summarize all of this in five minutes. As I close, it says, let love be without hypocrisy. Hate evil and love good. Be kind and honor others. Don't be lazy in anything. But both spiritual and secular serve God with passion and and, 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 and spirit of excellence. Don't be lazy. All of these are different commandments. Different exhortations. Do this, do this, you know. Don't be lazy. Uh, but don't be hypocritical. You know, uh, be passionate about your work. Um, be kind. Honor one another. But there's, there's an underlying... See, what I'm about to share with you, and I'm going to expand it next week by the grace and the mercy of God... There is an underlying thing here that you need to get. I like the way the Apostle Paul, he says it later on in this chapter and then in chapter 13. There is an underlying thing here and it is love. See, instead of trying to keep all the commandments, don't be lazy. Don't be hypocritical. Um, uh, Honor others. Be kindly affectionate, you know, uh, one to another. In brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. You can do all of everything that has been said there. And watch this. I'm giving you a universal law here now. Every, every exhortation and commandment in the New Testament will be fulfilled by simply keeping the commandment of love. 
So instead of trying not to do this or not to do this or not to do this or to do that, you know, these exhortations just are just, they're just telling us how to apply love. Apply, how to apply it. But the underlying thing here is love. And that's why the Bible says, we're going to see this in chapter 13, and it also says it in other places in the New Testament. He says, love is the fulfilling of the law. If you walk in love, you will fulfill everything that has been said here. Your love will not be with, with hypocrisy. You will honor others. You will not be lazy. You will be fervent in spirit. I say, ah, Pastor, how? I tell you. What this to me, Olubi Johnson, by the grace and the mercy of God, is the greatest revelation God has given me. You know, and it evolved. When I first started out in the, in the, in the, in the, in the 1980s, I used to define love as the ability to discern, to desire, and do what is best. I got it from the Word of God. But over the years, it, the clarity has increased. The Bible says that the path of righteous shines more and more. This is how I define love now. When I say I, I, yet not I, but the grace of God which is within with me. And I discovered that if you apply it, 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 it will fulfill everything that we've read and the one we're going to read after. Everything you see in Ephesians, everything you see in Colossians, everything you see in First Thessalonians, every instruction that you have been given will be, will be fulfilled by simply walking in love. And I'll explain. It's because when you understand what love is, you know what love is? It is the ability to discern by the wisdom that comes from God's word all these things. Don't be hypocritical. Don't be lazy. That's what God's word tells you. The wisdom, that, that's why you need to know the word of God. If you don't know the word of God, you can't walk in love. Whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Then, by the compassion to feel, you know, uh, uh, what God would feel. Compassion is spiritual sensitivity to feel, not what men are feeling, but what God is feeling about the situation. Because God's feelings are governed by his wisdom. His, 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 his feelings don't dictate to his wisdom. His wisdom dictates to his feelings. And I preached this during the pandemic shutdown. You know, lovely time. I, we, we, I, I taught on compassion. I've been teaching it for years, but with greater clarity. You have four main fruit of the spirit that define compassion. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faithfulness. Those four define compassion. That's how you can feel you're gentle, you're good, you're, and then you are long-suffering. That's how God is. God is long-suffering. You can't be compassionate if you're not long-suffering. So you discern uh, by wisdom... You feel by compassion from the fruit of the Spirit. And then you do by power. Dunamis. From the life of God. You now convert the life of God to power through intercession and prayer and all of that. To do whatever it is God would do in every situation. That is a very comprehensive definition of what love is. Because God is love. You see the Bible doesn't say, the Bible does not say love is God. It says God is love. It is God who defines love. It is not love that defines God. So when we're talking about love, we're talking about what God would do. So how do I walk in love? With wisdom that comes from God's word. Compassion that comes from God's fruit, the fruit of the spirit. And power that comes from God's life. When I have those three things, I will, everything that is said here, I will be doing it. I'll be patient, I'll be kind, I will not be envious, I will honor others, I will not be lazy in business, I will, I, I will be fervent in spirit, because that's how God is. Give him a clap offering, somebody. Hallelujah. So, for you, well, I have to take this in my next lesson. For you to keep these New Testament commandments, and any other commandment, you know, Paul said this, he said, every commandment, all can briefly comprehended this saying. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then Paul, John goes a step further by the Holy Ghost and takes it into the New Testament. He says, and this is his commandment. That we should love one another, you know, as he has loved us. You know, 
we, 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 uh, uh, in First John chapter 3, he said, Believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. Then in verse 24, he says, And hereby we know that we are in him because he's given us of his spirit. You can't, the only way you can perfect, the word perfect just means allow it to run its full course. You can perfect the love of God is to use the word of God, the compassion of God, the fruit of the spirit, and the power of the Holy Ghost. That's why speaking in tongues becomes very important. When you pray a lot in tongues, the wisdom, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I have, I'm going to do this again next week in a greater form, but, but I just, I, I need to close this now. The wisdom of what to do in the situation for that day will be given to you. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The compassion, because those things are spiritual forces. Goodness is a force. Kindness is a force. Gentleness is a force. Long-suffering is a force. Faithfulness is a force. It emanates from the human spirit by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then it's incident on the mind, the will, the emotions, the body, the circumstances. So you start behaving like God in that situation. You think like God. You feel like God. You act like God will in, 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 in every situation. So when a situation presents itself for you to be envious or wants to step through, you, you just won't fall for it. Because you see through it. You see through it. So to, in order to keep all of these commandments, concentrate and focus on keeping the commandment of, everybody say the commandment of life and love. You cannot keep the commandment of love if you don't keep the commandment of life. It's impossible. See, I, 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 with this, I've been preaching this thing since the early 80s, you know, over 30 something years now. For something here, I, I, I discovered that that's where the problem has been with the church. I'm going to deal with that in my main message later on. Is that fundamental understanding of the life of God. The people are trying to walk in love. They're just natural human love. That's why it's with, it's with hypocrisy. Oh God, I, I, something just came to me. I, I'll go close with this. Barnabas. That dissimul the word dissimulation is exactly the same word that Paul used in, Ga in Galatians. Barnabas and Peter and Paul were in Galatia, they were with the brethren who were Gentiles. They were all eating, drinking together because in Christ there is no Gentile or there is no Jew. Then some people came. Talk about love with hypocrisy. Some brethren now came from James in Jerusalem to come and, you know, visit and, and, and fellowship with them. Immediately the Jewish brethren came but, um, 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 Peter and Barnabas, who should know better, who had the same apostolic calling and anointing that Paul had. He said they separated themselves from the Gentiles. So they would not eat, so that they would, they would not, you know, offend the Jewish brethren because the Jewish tradition, you know, and, 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 and ceremonial laws do not allow you to eat and fellowship with the Gentile. So what happened was that they all, they, they, Peter, followed by Barnabas, separated themselves from the Gentile brethren. Only Paul full on it. I said it in our language and I said it deliberately by the Holy Spirit. Paul was angry. You know why? It was hypocrisy. That's what he was talking about here. Let love be without dissimulation. They were walking in love towards the brethren. They were all eating and drinking together. Suddenly something happens and the situation changes and then you now, the, the real man now comes out. Oh! I don't want the brethren from Jerusalem to think I am eating with Gentiles. So Peter first, then followed by Barnabas, they separated themselves. Paul knew that he had to stand up and talk. He had to. Because Paul was Jewish too. Even if Paul didn't join them and if Paul was silent, the Gentile brethren would be wondering what's going on here. So Paul said, I withstood him to the face. And I said, ah, uh, ah, uh, Peter. This is Olubi Johnson's paraphrase. 
Peter and Barnabas. You guys ought to know better. If eating with the Gentiles is making me guilty, and is making then it means everything Jesus died for is of no consequence. He said, if I begin to pull down the things that I built, he said, I make myself a transgressor. God forbid. You know, and that thing is still in the church today. There's so many times we move, when people come around and a situation changes, you know, we, we, we're, we're, we're so unstable, we move with what is popular. Instead of standing on God's word. The only thing that will make you do that is if you get perfected in the love of God. So the love of God will not only, it will, not only will it be in your, in, in your mind, because you know what the Bible says, but it will affect your emotion. It will affect your will, your emotions, your body, your circumstances. So you will behave like God and not like a man in every situation. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. You behave like God and not like a man. Paul behaved like God in that situation. Peter and Barnabas behaved like men. And these are leaders, apostles, two of them. Apostle Peter and Apostle Barnabas. Both of them were apostles. And they were misleading the Gentiles. Thank God for Paul. Give Paul another clap off. A proper one is alive. He's always in heaven. And he, he's saying, OJ, oh, thanks for that. Thanks. Hallelujah. Amen. God have mercy on us. Let's talk to God. Romans chapter 12. In our last lesson, we stopped, I believe it was in verse 11. We looked at verses 9 to 11 in our lesson last week. And in, in summary, Paul was telling the Roman brethren, and by extension to all of us today, that our love should be without hypocrisy. And I highlighted the example of uh, Barnabas and Peter, whose love towards the Galatian brethren, the Gentile Galatians, was with hypocrisy because they were eating and drinking with them, you know, previously. Then when some people came from Jerusalem, from James, in order not to look as though they were breaking Jewish uh, tradition, or, well, yeah, Jewish uh, commandments, because, you see, you have to understand that the um, thinking in those days, this was just shortly after Jesus was raised from the dead. You know, it wasn't too many years. So a lot of the Jewish traditions were still strongly entrenched. We call them strongholds. In their mind, their will, and their emotions. Even though they knew, Peter knew the truth. And, 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 uh, and, and uh, Barnabas, they knew the truth that, you know, keeping ceremonial law does not make you any ho more holy or doesn't make you a better person, you know, by keeping the laws of Moses, killing the animals, and in particular, not eating with Gentiles, you know. But that was, that was a thinking, you know, if, you, if you're a holy person, you don't eat with Gentiles. So when these guys came from Jerusalem, you know, from James, they acted with hypocrisy. They stopped eating with the Gentiles so that these other people would not think of them that, you know, maybe they're not as holy as they should be. And when Paul saw it, Paul was very, very angry. And correctly so. You know, and he, he had to correct it publicly so that there would not be confusion in the church. Had Paul not spoken up or had Paul joined them, the Gentiles would have been confused. You know, but thank God Paul stood for what was true. You know, and said, no, 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 this isn't right. It's not eating or not eating. He says, you know, I'm justified by faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not justified by keeping the law of Moses, which includes not eating with Gentiles. So if it's not keeping with Gentiles, that's going to keep me, make me holy, then I am I'm a transgressor. I make myself because I'm, I'm now building the things I destroyed. I said these things are no longer important. Now I'm now acting in the opposite direction as though they are important. Anyway, and so uh, 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 Jesus tells us of God, well, Jesus through the Holy Spirit, through Paul, tells us that love should not be without dissimulation. We should abhor what is evil. The word abhor is a very strong word. Another word for that is hate. Hate evil. And you know, all of us should have that. That's why you need to say it because, you know, in our mind and in our will and in our emotions, we've, we, over the years, 
you know uh, before we got born again and even after we got born again particularly for people who have not been renewing their mind with the word and allowing the spirit of god to change their emotional uh, 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 structure so to speak you know we love we love evil you know people the people, people in the world they, they, you know as i say i hate iniquity you have to say it and say it and say it and pray it in tongues so that your your whole your emotions will change and you will truly hate evil you will truly hate it you know as i'm just talking i'm reminded of what happened sadly with David. You know, David was a man after God's own heart, and we all know that. You know, and truly he loved the Lord, and he didn't like evil. He really didn't. You know, but he did evil. <laughs> because you see, you have to understand that what makes us do evil is the sin nature that is still in the mind, the will, the emotions, and inside the physical body. He saw another man's wife, he, he slept with her, and then he killed the man. So when. Um, Nathan, his friend, the prophet, confronted him. You know, he, he, he told, he just gave him a parable. He said one man had a lot of sheep and all of that. Then one other man just had one sheep. Then the man that had plenty went to take the one from the man. Immediately David was angry. He hates evil. <laughs> he, you know, he was angry. You know, he was with indignation, which is what we should do. But he didn't apply to himself. <laughs> he, he should have had that anger, you know, to himself when he saw Bathsheba having a bath and not have done what he did. So what I'm trying to say is that even when we know that this is evil and we should hate it, particularly when it concerns us and our flesh and what we like, at that time we don't hate evil as we should. But you should hate evil all the time. Whether it, it, whether it is your advantage or not. Uh, that, that's the lesson there. So, we should abhor that which is evil. We should be kindly affectioned one to another. With brotherly love in honor preferring one another. We looked at all this last time. Not slothful, not lazy in business. A lot of Christians are very lazy. You know, they're not industrious. And they, they, the cop-out is that, oh, they're serving God and God will do it. No, God will do it through you. <laughs> Amen? I'm going to come back to that in a minute slothful in business fervent in spirit you should be passionate whatever you do you should do it with passion with 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 a, with a great deal of enthusiasm to to do and do it properly you know uh, serving the lord it doesn't matter what you're doing whether you're a doctor whether you're a lawyer whether you're an engineer you know whatever it is that you do you should do it properly now i, I made a statement last time and i'm going to continue with that this morning that all these commandments, the commandments uh, to love without hypocrisy, to hate evil, to cleave to that which is good, to be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not to be slothful in business and fervent in spirit, every single one of them is kept by keeping the commandment of love. See, I, I've said this many times, I'm going to keep saying it, you know, until Jesus comes. I believe the greatest revelation God has given me as a person, Olubi Johnson, is the revelation of the love of God. It evolved over the years. You know, I, I'd never really heard anybody say the way God taught it to me. You know, uh, when I first wrote my books in 1988, you know, 87, 88, Practical Guide to Prayer, I said love is being able to discern and to desire and to do what is best that's how i said it you know but there was something in my heart but over the many years god now evolved that he developed it and this is it love is to discern by the wisdom that comes from god's word to feel by the compassion that comes from the fruit of the spirit and to do by the power that comes from god's life what god would do in every situation because God is love. It is God who defines love. It is not love that defines God. You know, I've never heard, I've never heard anybody say it like that. You know, but it's, it, I, you can take it to the bank. I, yet not I, but the grace of God which is with me, you know, has enabled me. And if you understand that, you understand all of these things. God, love, is, if, 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 you, if you walk in love, then you're allowing, it is actually God 
who is working in and through you. Because God is love. So it is God who, who will not allow his love to be with dissimulation. God will abhor that which is evil. God will cleave to that which is good. God will be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. God in honor will prefer one another. Look at, look at, look at the three persons of the Godhead. Look at, look what, what a wonderful example. See how they prefer one another. See how they honor one another. I, I said this some months ago. You know, you know, the, the, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those are just titles. They are titles that they have taken. Each person of the Godhead has taken those titles because of their particular function in the, in the plan of redemption after the decision was made to make man in their image and in their likeness. So each person had to have a, had to have a particular function. So the father has his function as the father. The Lord Jesus Christ, he, he, he's not God's son in the sense that God didn't give birth to him. <laughs> you know, when he's the son of God, you know, the, 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 the natural human mind, you know, you, you hear silly people say, uh, how can God have a son who was his wife? <laughs> you know, they're thinking only in the natural. No, 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 no. The word son is just a title that the second person of the Godhead took to come to the earth through the Virgin Mary, and that's why he's God's son, because the, 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 the seed that, that fertilized the egg in Mary's womb came from God. So literally, he is God's son. You know, the, the, the physical body which the second person of the Godhead occupied was uh, um, 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 formed by God's word. So literally, he's God's son. And he's the only one. That's why it's because he's the only begotten of the Father. He's the only human being that was born with the nature of God, you know, uh, um, 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 by natural birth. All of us were, were, sons, were born by natural but we died spiritually. And that's why we have to be born again. But Jesus never died spiritually. He only, well, he did, but that was on the cross, you know. But before then, he was, he was son of God. So he was son of God. You know, and then the Holy Spirit is, you know, the, the third person of the Godhead. And, and look at how they honor each other. See, the... G the Holy Ghost will not speak of himself. He will only say what Jesus... Doesn't the Holy Spirit have a mind? Doesn't he have an opinion? Of course he does. You know? The Holy Spirit is God. He's very intelligent. You know? But they never do anything independent of one another. They are interdependent. So they do it. Everything is done with harmony and consultation. In honor, preferring one another. And you see the Father, the Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit submitting themselves to the Father. Not because he's superior to them, because it's just a part of the plan. And then you see the father himself, you know, doesn't do anything without the approval and the consultation with the other two persons of the Godhead. You don't see the father just doing anything he will. He, he, he's magnified his word far above his name. But who wrote the word? The Holy Ghost. <laughs> Glory. Give the Lord a clap offering somebody. God the Holy Ghost. Amen. So it's subject to him. You know, they're all subject to one another. That's what God is trying to teach us. That we should be like God. And, and in our relationship with one another, we should honor one another. You know, we should, we, we should submit to one another. You know, and we have different functions. You know, titles. You see, my wife's title, you know, is wife. <laughs> my title is husband. But you know, in Christ, there is no male or female. But we take those functions because that's the function we have because we're here on earth. Just for this time until Jesus comes. Amen. So while we're in here on earth, we operate in our functions and then we do what wife does and we do what husband does. <laughs> I don't know if I'm helping anybody here. It's a great revelation. You know, God will not be slothful in business. Can you imagine God being slothful? You know, God is fervent in spirit. God serves himself. He, you know, he, everything he does, he does it excellently. The other day I was meditating, you know, on, on God and heaven. This thought came to me. I've actually said it here in church before, you know. But the, it is, it, 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 when I say what I want to say now, you'll appreciate what I'm, what, what I'm talking about. You know, God is such a wonderful person that he goes out of his way to make things beautiful. And to do things well. He doesn't take shortcuts. Fervent in spirit. So no way God's going to design the gates in heaven. He used a pearl. He could have used, he could have used a, a square gate. 
each of the gates. Go and check it in the book of Revelation. You know, you say, one pearl. Why? Aesthetics. Give a lot of clap offering. God likes beautiful things. Beautiful. You know, but it's wacko. It's much more difficult to make a, 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 a gate with a pearl than to make it with just, you know, a rectangle. Try it. Let any of the architects and, and, and engineers here, they'll tell you. It's much more, you know, it's intricate. So you've got, to, you've got to give time and you've got to give, you know, effort to it. That's how God is, you know. And we should be like that. And, you know, the Lord was telling me this. I said, I don't know. I was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was brushing my teeth or something, you know, in the bathroom just a few days ago. And he said, remember, you, uh, yeah, yeah, I remember now. You see, in my bathroom, they bought me some new stuff, you know, which is nice, you know. But there was something that was missing, you know, for functionality. So the Lord was now reminding me of heaven. He said, he said, he said you know, I made that with one pearl. You know, he said, he, said, he said, so aesthetics and beauty is very important. He said, but never sacrifice functionality. He said, so you all, always blend aesthetics with functionality. Don't go for aesthetics and then the thing is not functional. But at the same time, don't just go for functionality without aesthetics. Blend them. That's what he was telling me. Can you imagine? Well, brushing my teeth. <laughs> you know, that's how God is. You know? So not slothful in this. Uh, now, let's go to verse 12. Where it's going to start today. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continue to stand in prayer. This is a formula. Some people say there are no formulas in God's word. It's a principle. Whenever you're facing anything, practice this. I've done it over the years. It works. Rejoice in hope. Rejoice in the hope of whatever it is you are believing God for in that situation. See, a hope is an, expect, uh, an, uh, an earnest expectation that God will do something that has not yet come into physical manifestation. That's why it's hope. Hope is futuristic. You know, it is faith that gives substance to hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. When you now believe it and you now begin to act upon it by confession of God's word, by praying in tongues, by walking in love, you now release the spiritual power that will cause what is a hope to become a present reality. And that is how you go from hope to faith. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. It's not yet a, in physical manifestation, but because you are acting in faith, you are now releasing the spiritual creative substance to make that hope a present reality. So what he's telling you is that when you are facing anything, even though the thing has not yet come, be, be, start rejoicing in the hope. Rejoice, even though you have not seen it yet. You start saying, Father, thank you. I thank you, you know, because I know this is something I say all the time now. Whenever I'm faced any, with anything I'm praying about, I never go to God and, and start begging God and say, oh God, do this. I say, Father, I thank you. I know you are working on it. That's faith. I'm rejoicing in hope. It's not manifest yet, but I'm saying, Father, I thank you. I know you are working on it. And then I do the next thing. He said, patient in tribulation. That is consistent in the tribulation. You know, when, when, when a trial is when something has not yet come into manifestation. You haven't yet got the victory. The, the, the victory has not come to manifestation. He said, you should be patient. Doing what? Continuing instant in prayer. That's where you, it's not just confession. You know, one of the things about the faith message that, you know, um, uh, was, it was actually there. It was only that uh, people didn't uh, emphasize the connection. We were taught, you know, when you believe in God for something, you say it, which, the, which is true. Jesus said, who serves shall say. But it, saying alone was not, is not complete. You have to back it with praying in the tongues. And bro bro Brother Hagen in particular taught us a lot about praying in tongues. But, you know, the connection that, you know, um, if you're praying about, you know, if you, if, if you believe in God for something, you pray in tongues about it. It was said implicitly, but probably not explicitly. So a lot, of, a lot of believers, a lot of word of faith people, and that's where I came from, you know, were 
were concentrated on the word and speaking the word and sometimes did not emphasize enough of praying in the spirit. Because if you don't pray in the spirit, you're not able to overcome the principalities and powers, the, 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 the princes of Persia that want to block the word. God told Daniel, you know, from the very first day, your word was heard. So the word works. But if Daniel had not prayed for 21 days and, 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 and got Michael to intervene to overcome the prince of Persia, that, thing, that word, even though it's God's word, even though God had agreed to it, even though it was working, it would not have come to physical manifestation. And that's what Paul is telling us here. He said, continuing. Well, how, how, how long? Thank God. At least my wife is on my side. No other person but my wife. Thank God. Hallelujah. The question is, how long do I continue for until the manifestation comes? I didn't hear you. I said, how long do I continue for? See, this is the problem with so many of us. We're so weak need. The Bible says, lift up the hands that hang down. You know, and strengthen the feeble knees. You should, you know, many of us, if we don't get an answer in a week or, or, or a few days, we get discouraged. And then we stop praying. The exact opposite of what he says here. Re Everybody say rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing. Oh, scream it out. Turn to your neighbor and say, continuing. Don't stop. Continuing. Fervent. Instant. In praying in the spirit. Until the answer comes. So it may take, it may, some things will take a day, 24 hours. Some things will take three days. Something may take 21 days. Something may take years. But continue. I didn't hear amen. People don't like to hear ye. <laughs> uh, God forbid bad thing. My own no go take years. <laughs> you know, that's wishful thinking. Depends on what you are praying for. And it also depends on how, you are, how fast you are allowing God to work inside you. There are some things will not come until patience in you has had its perfect work. In that particular context. And, 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 and you know, I'm going to preach in that message in a few, maybe, maybe next week. You know, you know uh, uh, receiving the promise. It takes time. God gives, but before you receive it. See, if, if, if Pastor Williams asked me, for this iPad. He said, Pastor Lubi, please, can you give me the iPad? I said, ah, yes, Pastor William, here it is. But he hasn't received it yet. I've given it. He has to get up from where he is. He has to walk towards me and grab it and take it from me. That's receiving. There is a big difference between God giving and us receiving. And we, all, we, all, we automatically assume that once God has given it, we'll receive it immediately. No. No. That's where the faith work comes in. That's why to receive, I have to keep saying it. I have to keep praying in the spirit. I have to keep walking in love. I have to keep walking in forgiveness. I have to keep walking in thanksgiving. All the things combined. And you can't take any of those things out of the picture. You know, if, if, if you confess and, and, and you pray in tongues, but you don't forgive, it's going to block it. If you say the word and all that, and then you don't give thanks to God, before the thing comes, you're not going to be strong in faith. The Bible says Abraham was strong in faith. Giving glory to God. Before the answer. Most people are going to give thanks to God after the answer. We need to sing that song one of these days. I think next week, Pastor Andrew, the Thomas kind of faith. <laughs> you know, most people, that's the kind of faith they have. The Thomas kind of faith. They want to see it first. He's not going to have the, that mountain. David Ingo sang it. You know, it will stay in the same old place. Hope so, think so, maybe so. We'll never win the race. <laughs> you know? No. You got to, you got to, you got to, you've got to say thank you to God before the answer comes. Do you know why? The answer is already real. It's only that in the, it's, it's only in the spirit realm. So if you truly believe that God has already given it, even though you have not yet received it, you will say thank you. If you don't, if you don't say thank you, then you don't believe God has already given it. So thanksgiving is an 
act and an attitude of faith. I don't know if I've helped anybody here. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing in standing prayer. Let the devil serve notice on Lucifer and his boys. The principalities and the powers and rulers that has that this guy you're seeing, I'm not going to stop until the answer comes. Nothing you're going to do is going to discourage me. How do you stand for? As long as it takes. Stand until Jesus comes, if necessary. I don't care. I don't care how long it takes. Because you see, I know it's not God who's holding out on me. It's the principalities and powers that are trying to delay it. And the sooner I have a victorious militant attitude, the faster my answer is going to come. The many of the time we always, we always blaming God. What an insult. God can never forget you. He said, if, if, if a woman forgets her suckling child, he said, will I forget you? I didn't go to God and start telling him, oh, God has not forgotten you. You are right there, engraving on the palm of his hands. Are you listening to me? It is you who need to let patience have her perfect work. For you have need of patience. That after, not before, you have done the will of God. Then you will receive the promise. We always blame God. Oh, Lord. In our language, that means, God, please don't forget me. Then we start to cry and we get emotional. And God begins to look at us and say, you don't understand. I can only respond in faith. Do you want to make me a liar? I can't contradict my word for you. Even though I love you very much. So go back to the word. And find out what my word says. Then act upon it. Then you give me a legal basis to move. You don't do that. This is your emotional stuff. It's not, I can't move on your emotion. I can only move on the basis of my word. That's why many Christians live and die. Ah, what was God looking at? Why did he God do something? God was trying to do everything he could do. We were not responding in faith. And you can't push God. You cannot use, you cannot blackmail God emotionally. You cannot use emotional blackmail on God. Ah, no, if you don't do this, God will just be looking at you. He's going to stay on his word. But once you get, let me, let me, let me, let me, the Syrophoenician woman. Let me remember that story. Gentile woman. Her daughter was, you know, oppressed by the devil. She was doing all the things we normally do. Scream, shout, cry. The Bible says, Jesus didn't answer. Jesus did uh-uh. You know, the, the thing got to Peter and the other boy, because they felt Jesus was being hard-hearted. They felt, Jesus, yes, they didn't say it, but that's how they felt. They felt that Jesus was being very, very insensitive. The woman was weeping, crying. Crying after that, she even followed them to the hotel. You know, in those days, I don't know where they stayed. But she found out where she was, he was staying. You know, and crying. Jesus didn't answer her. I said, hey, what kind of God is this? I don't answering people. At least even if you're not going to, even if you're not going to give her, at least tell her to go away. So anyway, the woman finally got, I don't know how she got through Peter and James and John. Anyway, she finally got to Jesus and said, oh, Lord. You know, like all of us do that thing. Get emotional. <laughs> Jesus said, hmm, you don't understand. It's not as if I don't want to heal your daughter. This will be a paraphrase. I don't, I don't want to heal your daughter. Or I don't want to answer your prayer. He said, I am not sent. I have a legal. I am only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And it is not right for me to take the children's bread. And give it to dogs. That's enough to offend 99% of the church. Let me increase that. 99.9. <laughs> yeah. Majority of us would have been offended. And walked away. And, and said, I don't know what kind of Messiah that one is. In fact, it's not even Messiah. What kind of prophet is he? I'm sure there's something wrong with them in Nazareth. <laughs> oh, yes. You see, because at that time, many people didn't even know who he was. They just knew he was a prophet who used to heal. They didn't know he was really, you know, the Messiah. 
So she could have kissed like God offended. Ah, that woman, God helped her. Because of the honesty of her heart. You know what she said? She said, true Lord. But even the dogs get the crumbs. She gave him a legal basis to move. He said, woman, great is thy faith. Thy daughter is healed. Give him another clap offering somebody. Sit down. You need to understand God. God, turn to your neighbor and say, God is never holding out on you. God has not forgotten you. God has not forsaken you. The reason why your answer hasn't yet come is because you need to operate in faith. Give him another clap offering. I don't know if I've helped anybody here. I always know my notes. I just know that so many in our hearts we are blaming God. God. My back baby is a common thing in Yoruba. Ah, Oluwe rotting me. As if he's forgotten. It's an insult. Well, you're, what you're telling you're, 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 you're accusing him. Well, God, you know, let me tell you something about God. He's not very touchy. Love is not touchy or irritable. So he, he doesn't get angry with you when you do those silly things. He just, he just, you know, he understands your emotional, this thing. And he, what he's going to try and do, he's going to try and make you come to a church like this so you can hear this kind of message to help you. <laughs> He will try and find a way of getting somebody to come and tell you the right thing to do so you can. But he's, he's never holding out on you. He loves you too much to hold out on you. I don't know if I've helped anybody here. So, let's get back to the, to, the, to the Bible study. What we're saying is that if you walk in love, in other words, if you allow God, what is love? Take it from his emotional and all of that. You know, it affects emotions, but it's not an emotion. It's God working through you, through the wisdom of his word, the uh, compassion of his fruit, you know, and the power of his life. So to do what God will do in every situation. This is what God will do in all of these situations. You know, he is not going to be slothful in business. He's going to rejoice in hope. He's, not going to be, he's going to be patient in tribulation. He's going to continue standing in prayer. We see this in Jesus. Jesus is God in the flesh. Hello? Didn't Jesus rejoice in hope? Wasn't Jesus patient in tribulation? Wasn't Jesus continuing to stand in prayer? Hello, somebody. You know, that's another thing I love about God. He's not a hypocrite. There is nothing God has asked us to do that he has not done himself. And that in some cases, he's still not doing himself. How many people know that Jesus is waiting? There's an answer Jesus wants, but it hasn't yet come. You know what he wants? He wants to come back for his bride. <laughs> left, to go, left to Jesus, if he could, if it was possible, he would come tomorrow. But the conditions are not yet ready on the earth for him to come tomorrow. So you know what the Lord told him? He said, sit. Go and check this. It's, it's Psalm 110. You know? The Lord said to my Lord, <laughs> Jehovah said to Adonai. That's why the, Jesus said, whose who's, who's son is, 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 how come David is, is he says he's the son of David. He said, if David is his son, why did he call him Lord? In other words, me you are seeing, this Jesus Christ that you are seeing, I'm not just David's son, no. even though I'm David's son from the flesh, I am David's Lord. That's what he was telling them in code. So the Lord said to my Lord, Jehovah said to Adonai, sit, in other words, wait. <laughs> At my right hand, until I make that enemy, and he's still waiting. He's been waiting for 2,000 years. And you've been waiting for five weeks. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Give the Lord a clap of offerings. <laughs> Patient in tribulation. The man is still waiting. And what is he doing? He's not waiting passively. He's waiting actively. Every day he's praying. Ever living to make intercession until he can stand up whenever, when his enemies have been made his footstool. Glory to God. God is not a hypocrite. As we are waiting, God is also waiting. So it's not only you that has something you are waiting for. I don't know if I've helped anybody here. 
Oh, let's go, go, let's go, let's go. Okay. Verse 13. Distributing to the necessity of the saints. Given to hospitality. You know, all these, com- they're all commandments. They're not suggestions. They're all things written by the Holy Spirit through Paul. You know, God, if you let God work in you, if that's what love is. Love is allowing God to work in you, to will and to do of his good pleasure. Because God is love. So every time you, where you walk in love, you're allowing God to do what he would do in and through you. So he said, distributing to the necessity of the saints. That's what you should do. You want the reasons why you should be rich. You want the reason why you have, you know, abundance to meet your need, take care of yourself, your wife, your family, and all of that, and then have over that so that you can help distributing. Ah, well, this saint needs this, this one, uh, distributing to the necessity of the saints. One person I first heard preach this was S.G. Elton. I never forgot. I, and I wasn't there. I just heard the tape. I was in England, but he preached, I think, in the CSSM convention in Joss. I think it's 1977, 78. Anyway, you know, I, I, I listened to it. And, and, and it, the first prosperity message I ever heard was from Pa Elton. I later, you know, got it confirmed through Kenneth Hagen and um, 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 Dr. Paul Yonge Cho. This is my first year as a Christian. You know, I'll never forget it. Pa Elton said, God doesn't want you to be poor. Englishman. He was talking to youth coppers, you know, and, and, and it was the youth cop, you know, they, they had this convention. It was in Joss. I think it was the 17th. 78 or 978 or something, you know, by Elton. He said, God wants you to be a millionaire. They were all shocked. They were all shocked. Ah, by Elton came. Ah, you know, by Elton said, yeah. And then he gave us those scriptures. I can never forget it. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 and 9, 8. I first heard it from, from, from and I stayed in my spirit all these years. He said, God wants you. He said, he doesn't want you to. He said, he wants you to be a millionaire. He says, and he, then he quoted the scripture. I can never forget it. Pa Elton, he quoted the scripture. He said, distributing to the necessity of the saints. That's why you need God working in your circumstances. So he can provide material provision. See, love is discerning with wisdom, feeling with compassion, and doing by power, the power of God's life. When he now works in your circumstances, he now causes things to work together so you can have the money to distribute to the saints. Given to hospitality. So when people come to see you, you have something to give them. You can have a place where they can sleep. You can give them food. You know, you can... Yeah. You see, all these things, they all come from God. That's the kind of person God is. Remember the day God visited Abraham. We talked about this on Wednesday. You know, God is a very, very nice person. You know, Abraham, Abraham was, you know, in the heat of the day. He saw three guys. Ah! He under, immediately he discerned that it was the three persons of the Godhead. So he ran and he prostrated. And then he asked them to come in. And they came in. You know, God is not proud. Though. Can you imagine God staying in one old tent? <laughs> you know, that Abraham pitched. But God is nice. So God sits down. The three persons, three persons of the Godhead. He said, ah! You know, I say it in Yoruba. Ah! Kile Majesa. Ah! Ekbelesa. In our language, that means, ah, what are you going to eat? You know, ah, please, you know, you're welcome, sir. You know, and, and he quickly tells Sarah to go and quickly make some food. And, and, and God is patient. He just sat down there, made the food, you know, and all of that. God wants us to be like that. Given to hospitality. Given to hospitality. Christians should be known for acts of charity and kindness. We should be known for generosity. Ah, if you go to, ah, they will help you. Those people, they always help people. Can I say that about you? Given to hospitality. Verse 14, I could go on and on. Bless them with persecution. Ah, the Holy Ghost just stopped me. Just before I say this, this given to hospitality, you know, you know, this love it involves um, wisdom to discern. The scripture just came to me. That's why you need to know the Bible. 
As I just finished that, I was about to go. Who said you haven't finished that? He said, in, I think it's in First or Second John, you know, the, the epistles. He said that if any man come to your house and he doesn't bring this doctrine, he said, don't allow him, neither give him, bid him God's speed. He said, for he that bided him God's speed is a partaker of his. He's talking about people with the Antichrist spirit and people who are teaching the wrong thing. Now, he wasn't just talking about general people. You know, I'm not talking about your uncle or your uncle. Be kind to them. You know, but if somebody is a false teacher, then such a person, you don't show them hospitality. You, in fact, in the context in which John was writing, he was talking about the church. It's in your house. In those days, the church was in the house. They didn't, we didn't have cathedrals back then or, or buildings like this. The church it hadn't yet grown to that level. You know, most of the build, most of the churches were in people's houses. So when he said that, if somebody comes and he doesn't have the doctrine, don't don't allow him to come and start teaching your people. And don't bid him Godspeed. That means that when he's growing, don't give him money. So they're not a partaker of his evil deeds. So that's where we need the wisdom of God. You know, yes, we should be given to hospitality, but not in the case where somebody is. You know, saying Jesus is not the Christ, you know, doesn't believe in the doctrine of God, and that's the context, you know, or somebody who is, you know, antagonistic against the gospel. Such people, you, you know, avoid them. You don't, you don't, you don't, you know, show them hospitality. So God says, I should correct that, or I should add that rather. Because, you see, anytime you read the Bible, you have to read the Bible in the context of the entire book. Otherwise, you will misinterpret scripture. So many Christians are so gullible. They are so gullible because they don't know the word of God. And they act basically on emotion, you know, without having the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God should direct your emotion. Your emotion should not direct your wisdom. I don't know if I helped anybody. Let's, let's move on. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. If people say bless them, bless bad people when they persecute you. Bless them. That sounds so contrary. Jesus said, if they slap on the left cheek, turn the right. And they say, ah, they'll just finish you. No, they won't. God will step in and protect you. Are you listening to me? Bless them which persecute you and speak evil of you. You know? Don't curse. Don't, don't be like them. Don't, 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 don't retort. Don't, don't return, you know, uh, reviling for reviling. And, you know, when you are angry, sometimes you do that. You shouldn't, but you know, when you're angry, you're, you'd have said it even before you think. remember Paul. When I, when I, <laughs> what shite <shy> Paul? <clears throat> I said that in Yoruba deliberately. They slapped Paul. Immediately came and said, You why? <laughs> you know, it showed that Paul was still growing. And then, you know, uh, then they now rebuked him and said, Ah, revile thou God's high priest. He said, Oh, boy, then I'm sorry. I did not know that he was high priest. One should not speak evil of the ruler of his people. In fact, the correct thing is that it doesn't matter who it was. He shouldn't have returned. Remember Jesus? You know, they slapped him too. More than once. They, 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 they took his beard. They cut it. Then they slapped him. They, they, they blindfolded him. And you know what they said? Prophesy. Who slapped you? Can you imagine that level of provocation? You know what the Bible says? He answered them. Not a word. And then you know at the end, you know what he did? He blessed them. Father, forgive them. Give him a clap offering. Give a standing offering. Hallelujah. A standing ovation for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our example. Bless them who persecute you. He never, Jesus never rendered evil for evil. Sit down, sit down, sit down. I don't know if I'm helping anybody. Okay. All of these things can be done by walking in love. See, that's, the, that's what I want you to see. That's why I'm using these examples. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. You see Jesus doing the same thing. You know, when people were blessed, you see Jesus rejoicing with them. You know, when they brought children to come and for him to pray over, he prayed over them, you know, bless them, you know, he was kind and nice to people, when they didn't have food, he fed the 5,000, rejoice, 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 
Then when, they, when Lazarus died, he wept with them. Though he raised him from the dead. You know, so, we, bottom line, folks, act like God. How? You say, how will I know what God will do? How will I know how God will behave? That's where walking in the Spirit comes in. If you don't know the Word of God, you will not know how, what God will do in, in, in a particular situation. If you're not walking in the Spirit, don't have the fruit of the Spirit, you will not feel what God is feeling. Because it's compassion. It's what God is feeling about the situation. And if you don't have the life of God in, in sufficient measure, you will not have the power to do what God will do. So at the end of the day, to keep all these commandments, not just these ones, but the entire New Testament and Old Testament, the, all, the, the secret is to walk like God. And do what God will do. That's what is called walking in love. Be of the same mind. I didn't hear you. Am I talking to anybody here? Say, be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things. No, don't, don't, be, don't, be, don't, be, don't be proud. You know, we have a, a lot of our people are like that today. Mind high things. Ah, you know, you go to a particular place, you know, <laughs> I remember a particular something. I'm not going to mention the name of the people. It was many, many years ago. Many, many years ago. My wife will remember. You know, some people came, you know, to, to, to come and, you know, preach for us and all that that time all we had was a panel van that's what i had i didn't have a mercedes then i didn't have it that's all i had so i sent the car to go and pick them shalak eh pastor andrew remembers remember me oh you know they were angry they actually told me they said ah I insulted them. How can I send this kind of car? I said, that's what I have. Emma Bino. <laughs> that's called minding high things. Don't do that. Too. God will look upon it and he will not be happy. Condescend to men of low estate. If you are in a place, if what they have is just small, sit down and eat it with them. And bless them. God will promote them later, but never make them feel small. You know what? God watches all those things. Those are the things that God is looking at. That now determines, watch this, prof. The measure of grace and mercy you get. You go to somebody's house and you look at their furniture. Hmm. I will lay you along with you. help, Murara. The people may not even know. You know, you thought that you may not even say it. It may just be in your heart. There was a proud look. God, God will not say anything that time. Then you will come and pray. He's waiting for you. God, God, I want this, I want that. You that went to this person's house the other day, you said, Oh, ye must one. I will hear me. I will help. I will bless you, but not as much as I would have. Until you change that attitude. Pride is a terrible thing, and you know it's so innocuous. It's hidden. Sometimes we don't even realize we have it. A lot of people go there to somebody's house and say, "Ah, Mike," you know, and they immediately they will forget that they've done something. But that attitude follows them to the place of prayer. Condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own consists. Recompense to no man, evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. You know, never, you know, I'm learning it. I've not perfected it, but I'm learning it. Not to recompense evil for evil. The natural man, the flesh, the sin nature in the flesh, wants you to retaliate. Wants you to teach them a lesson. Don't do it. You're not good enough. Only God can teach them a lesson. Pray for them and leave them in God's hands. The Bible says, it, God will pour out wrath. But you don't know how to do it. And many times you hurt yourself when you're trying to do it. Don't recompense evil for evil. 
Provide for things honest in the sight of all. This is talking. There's another statement I can just. If this was tongues and interpretation, this provide things honest in the sight of all. You know what I'll say? Accountability. Provide. You know, if, if they give you a job or something to do, do an account. Make sure it is transparent. It is clear. This is what I used X for, Y for, Z for. for honest in the sight of men. Not because you are not honest, but you just want to show accountability to God and man so that they will not have something to say about you. When Paul went to go and collect the offering of the Gentiles, you know, from, from the Gentiles, and he was going to take to the poor saints in Jerusalem. Yeah, it should be his Paul. Paul is the ogre of everybody. He's the, he was the head of the church at that time, at least the Gentile church. He started all those churches, Corinth and something. So he had the authority. But you know, Paul didn't do that. He said, before I come, all of you collect offering, collect offering. He said, I will now send the offering with one of the brothers whose praise is in the gospel. He said, so that nobody can, they will not accuse us and say, we took the money from you and used it for something else. So when they now get to Jerusalem, they will now tell them everything. We should learn to be like that. Transparency, honesty, accountability. And, they, and that's how God is. Thank you, honey. Do you know that if God was like me or you, I was going to say you, but God said to make them happy. <laughs> you know, if God was like me or you, you understand? There are certain scriptures that will not be inside the Bible. God repented. Ah, you know, this is the Bible. <laughs> that Moses said, turn away. Go and read it. When you read that scripture, you will tremble. You know what? It was a rebuke. Not, not, a, not, not, not a disrespectful rebuke, but a, 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 he, he, was, he said, turn away from this thy fierce anger. God was really angry. God said, I'm going to destroy all these people. God said, ah, am I my baraje? That's the Yoruba. Yes. Let's be real, folks. Not all this religion. You know, and God said, turn away from this at first. And the Egyptians would say, and the Bible said, and God repented. If it was you or I, that Bible would not be there. It would not be accountable. <laughs> the, the, Moses, don't record that one. Don't record that one. Give the Lord a clap of him. God is very accountable. If it's possible, we're going to close in a minute. As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. You know, the Bible is a very practical book. He knows some people are very difficult. <laughs> That's why I said, the, the Bible put it there, if. <laughs> because you know, some people are impossible. Don't fight them, oh. But if you cannot live peaceably with them, just find your distance. Love them. Pray for them from a distance. You know, so wisdom of God will direct you. That's why I said, if it be possible, as, as far as you are concerned, it's okay. But if they want to fight and quarrel, and I just withdraw. Don't say, don't, don't, don't love them. Just, you know, pray for them and walk in wisdom. See, that's why wisdom is such a, uh, it's an essential, it is the principal part of love. If you don't have wisdom, you can't walk in love. What oh, you are calling is not love, it's just, you know, human emotion. Dearly beloved, I didn't hear you. Uh, don't your neighbor say, God is talking to you and me because we are accepted in the beloved. So this, this, this scripture is to us. Hello? Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. The same thing he said in the earlier verse. He's not expanding it. But rather give place unto wrath. In other words, if you don't avenge yourself and you behave yourself, it is God's anger that will come on that person if the person does not repent. For it is written, I didn't hear you. These are scriptures people don't like saying. But it's in the Bible. Hello? For it is written, vengeance is mine. Everybody say, vengeance is mine. Touch your neighbor and say, not yours. Ah! Give the Lord a clap offering. It's very... Do you understand the implication of that statement? Vengeance is mine, not yours. Not yours, Sarah. Not yours, Olubi. Not yours, Rhoda. Not yours, you know, Gwega. 
is not. You know why? You don't know how to deal it out. Most of the time, if you try and take vengeance, you hurt yourself. That's why I say, don't say, ah! Let me say it in Yoruba. I was translate back to English. Feel it for me. In our language, that means leave it to me. You know, because you see, when you try and do it yourself, you misbehave. In fact, you will sin. Your anger will get you to sin. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. Say, ah, how will I not sin if I'm angry? Once you keep anger for long, it will turn to sin. That's why it says, and do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Anger is okay, but it has to be very short and quickly get rid of it. Because if you keep anger, it will lead to sin. And you know what? It will give place to the devil. That's the next scripture there in Ephesians chapter 4. It says, neither give place to the devil. Anger kept for long leads to sin that gives place to the devil. I know people hold grudges for weeks. Some people for months. Don't. Vengeance is mine. Leave him to me. Pray for them and hope that they will repent. If they repent, fine. The whole problem is solved. If they don't repent, God knows how to deal with them. Forget it and move on. I don't know if I've helped anybody. Vengeance is mine, not yours. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thy enemy hunger, do what? This is not pretense. So. It's truth. If he's hungry, feed him. I just got a, I just got a text. A tweet. Even though they banned tweet, but the heavenly tweet is still flowing. I don't know where that came from. I just got a tweet from heaven. It's not the physical one. Is this? I just got a tweet from heaven. You know, and you know, the, the Lord was saying, <laughs> He said, Be like me. I bless the good and the evil. I allow the sun to shine on the good and the evil. I send the rain on the good and the evil. That's why you can bless bad people. Ah, I didn't hear amen. See, if he's hungry, feed him. You're just being like God. God would not say because that person did something, when the sun shines tomorrow, he will not shine on that man. So in the same way, if the person is hungry and you have provision, you know, ah, ah, that no, don't don't give him my food. Ah, no, 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 give him. You are being like God, that you may be like your Father which is in heaven. If he's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head if he doesn't repent. See, the goodness of God causes men to repent. When you're good to a bad person, many times, not all the time, but sometimes it will provoke them to repent, which is what you want. And thank God for that. But if they don't repent, ah, then coals of fire will come on his head. Let's close. Be not overcome of evil. Never allow evil to overcome the good in you. Always allow the God, the love, and the good in you to overcome evil. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Never, never allow evil to overcome you. You know, I've said it so many times over the years. The initiative is never with darkness, it's with light. See, this room cannot get so dark that it's going to drive out the light. The only way darkness can enter is if you reduce the light. And that's how it is in human relations. If you decide, it doesn't matter what they do. You see, once you base your, your, your Christianity and your interpersonal relationship on what people do to you, you will always be a yo-yo Christian. Up to date, down tomorrow. But if you have made up your mind, I'm going to walk in love, irrespective of what anybody does. What you do or not do to me or do not do to me will not change who I am. You will not define me. God has defined me. God is love and I am love. And that is not going to change irrespective of what you do or you don't do. Then you know what? You become free. For you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. You will not be going up 
with this emotion today down. Ah, oh, who cares? I'm going to do the right thing. If, if they don't, if they do not treat me right, God will raise somebody else who will treat me right. I'm not going to change the way I behave because of the way other people behave. I'm going to behave the way God behaves all the time. Talk to God, talk to God, talk to God. 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 God, talk to God, talk to God.